Thank you all those who came to the Unity Pavilion and those who joined us online. So we gathered today for a deep dialogue for harmony in Oroville. Um, so this meeting will start with a short introduction from Devon, uh, who represents Synthesis Oroville, uh, in a non-official, let's say, group of people. But Devon will uh, provide more details about this group. And uh, we here tonight to review the screening of the presentation by Ragu Anantanarayanan, Ragu, um, who had been interviewing the residents of Oroville, the representatives of the working groups, and uh, came up with the synthesis, let's say, of that uh, of those interviews. And uh, the presentation will be actually um, projecting the situation in Oroville, taking or seeing through the lens of the Mahabharata. And I hope that most of you, you took time to read through this um, introduction to the material, the reference materials. If not, you can find some uh, hangouts on that glass doors. Uh, and uh, after the screening, there will be a short break, and then later on, we will have a dialogue in a fishbowl format. So we are here with you together, the Residents Assembly Service, Giovanni and Tatiana, Devon, Aravinda, and other people who had been interviewed by Ragu, and also Reveal Radio and the Unity Pavilion team who made this event happen. Thank you, and I pass it on to Devon. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, thank you all again for joining. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, just to give a brief uh, background, uh, for those who don't know me, I uh, joined Oroville in 2016. Uh, it was on day one uh, that I came here for the first time. Uh, I decided to join Oroville. It was a deep uh, inner call. And since then, it's been a, a feeling of constant gratitude to be able to part of this adventure. Uh, so much of gratitude for all the pioneers and everyone who has built Oroville. And uh, of course, as a, as a newcomer, you go through and you also see uh, how there are challenges about, you know, for new people to come in and there are some needs to change. So there is also gratitude for people who want to build the city, you know, faster and, uh, and uh, you know, have more new people join in. Uh, but when this little over a year ago, when this crisis began and uh, uh, it was quite heartbreaking, uh, I'm sure for all of us, but especially for people who had recently come in to see, uh, you know, my mentors, you know, whom I really uh, deeply value, uh, have, you know, standing opposite each other and, and with different views. It was quite a heartbreaking uh, situation. And uh, I was really uh, yearning for spaces where there is deeper dialogue happening, you know, not just the surface uh, events that happen, of course, which, which did take uh, a lot of attention, but, uh, but what is the deeper, uh, you know, uh, thing happening? And in that quest, uh, I got involved part of various groups of residents. Uh, one was called Harmony, the other was called Confluence. And the most uh, consistent amongst them was a group called Synthesis, Synthesis Oroville. We would meet every Thursday, four o'clock uh, at Matri Mandir in the Stone Circle Garden. Uh, and there was no specific agenda, just a space where we can come and share from a deeper space. And how can we bring Synthesis, you know, uh, that was the intention. And uh, uh, in that meeting, I remember somewhere in the early August, this conversation came that uh, there has been a proposal of uh, inviting Raghu uh, to kind of hold a dialogue with residents of diverse perspective so that as a third person, he can come and he can understand and give a third person's view of what, uh, what he thinks is the, is the situation right now. Uh, more like what he calls a landscape study. 
And uh, his invitation came from Dena Meriam, who's the IIC chairperson, and uh, governing board uh, and the foundation team also kind of approved it. And it was in um, maybe end August, early September, I received a call from him saying that, uh, you know, he has been invited to do this and uh, he would like some resident of Auroville to give him some names. He says, for obvious reason, I don't want uh, the foundation to give me a list of people whom I should speak to. He said, I want the re some residents to give me names of few people who represent, you know, multiple views. And uh, I thought if I've been asked to do that, uh, I was really yearning for this space for deeper dialogue. So, uh, so I gave him, I think, close to 50 names. Uh, which I felt represented uh, diversity. Again, uh, I have a document uploaded today. Everything is transparent. All the emails I wrote, all the names, everything is there uh, online for you to see. And in week one, he was able to speak to 20 people. I was quite happy that he was able to speak to 20 people in the first week itself, uh, which represented diversity in gender, in nationalities, in, in you know, perspectives. Uh, and his initial intention was to come in October in Oroville and then present what he has understood. But after that conversation, he realized that uh, there's a lot more uh, that he still needs to understand before he can even share first level landscape study. So I think in October 1st to 4th, uh, he came along with uh, Dina. And I think they met some more residents one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, working committees from both the sides uh, also uh, met him and, uh, and some more residents. So I think uh, that has been the, uh, the process. And, uh, and it was somewhere, uh, so we were on Monday, so not last Tuesday, but the Tuesday before is when he was invited to share what he has understood with the governing board and the IIC team members. So this was an online uh, presentation that he made of what he has understood. It's more of like a first level, what he calls a landscape study. It's, it's a beginning of a dialogue. It's uh, nothing conclusive. It's uh, something to start the conversation, uh, as he will also uh, explain. And uh, so what we are doing now is we are kind of going to be uh, playing the presentation, uh, his presentation video, same what he had presented to GBIC. So there is no difference. Uh, we had already done it once uh, with a small set of people who had already spoken to him. Uh, and this is the second time we are doing that, which is open now to uh, anybody uh, from the community. It's also uh, online. Uh, people are there on Zoom. So, uh, so what we will do, uh, I'll invite Raghu to share a few words, and after that, we will play that video, which is the presentation that he made to GBIC. So, word by word, uh, we see what was presented, uh, and then we'll take a short break, and then uh, we'll have a chance to have a dialogue with him, uh, ask him questions. Uh, uh, again, since we have a large number, uh, it will be in a fishbowl format, where initially we will have people who has already spoken to him, has a more context to begin the conversation. Uh, but uh, when Naveen and Raji, when they actually hold the conversation, they will explain that. If from the audience, if somebody also wants to ask a question, we'll have a way for you to step in, ask the question. Uh, but the people who will start the dialogue will be, again, amongst those who have uh, already spoken to him. And then we can have dialogue and questions from all and and again uh, as uh, uh, Raghu will share that this is just a beginning uh, if if uh, you know when I asked him about the next steps uh, he said that uh, if uh, if the community finds value in this kind of a dialogue uh, he's happy to you know uh, give more of his time uh, if uh, we say okay thank you very much um, then, then that it that's it uh, but uh, his, his urge is that, uh, you know, uh, there should be a lot more dialoguing uh, that needs to happen within the community in this spirit. And if he can be of value, he'd be uh, happy to support. So the next step uh, after this will all depend on how, what value, uh, you know, we find as a community in this kind of a dialogue process. So uh, with that background, I'll... Uh, invite Raghu. Uh, thank you very much, Raghu, for uh, all the time and so much uh, effort that you've given in, in speaking to so many diverse people and, and, and sharing uh, your perspectives. So uh, before we play the video, I uh, would love to hear uh, something from you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Devan, and thanks to everybody who has spoken to me and who's willing to listen. <coughs> um, I just thought I would highlight one or two things because, um, you know, from the first two showings and some of the 
responses I've got, I think I need to highlight this. Uh, the first is um, I'm responding to data that's been given to me. So none of the uh, uh, statements I'm making are based on anything that I am personally uh, saying is X or Y or Z. Right? And I've listened to many people, so I'm trying to put together the process that I'm experiencing and I'm not talking about any particular events. <clears throat> now, this is very important to understand because one, I don't have any direct understanding of the events. And secondly, for in any community, events will come and go. But the way the events are given meaning will remain permanent. <clears throat> and that defines the culture of any group. And that's therefore important for you people to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, the second thing for you to keep in mind is I'm using some characters from the Mahabharata to illustrate certain archetypal energies at play. Now, I'm finding that there is some confusion <clears throat> between the word archetype and stereotype. Yeah, to explain the difference so that you keep it in mind when you're, when you're listening, an archetype is an essential quality, right? So some of you will probably know the Mahabharata. There is a very popular figure called Bhima, who in, you know, is something like a Rambo. Right? So the archetype of Bhima, the archetype of Rambo are the same. And it's exactly like, or if you take uh, a, another figure like Duryodhana or somebody like that, okay, or some great guy who's fighting Rambo, they're actually the same archetype. One has chosen to deploy this energy inside in a way that is constructive. The other is employing it in a way that is not so constructive. But the archetype is the same. So in my presentation, you'll see me talking about the functional aspects of the archetype, the dysfunctional uh, uh, way the archetype is deployed and the shadow. So obviously I'm not talking about any ideal. Okay. And these are not happening only individually. They seem to be happening collectively. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So have a good time listening and then I'll come back again and we'll engage in a, in a dialogue. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, we can be as transparent as possible. So it becomes a beginning of something constructive. And I must let you know also that after I made the presentation to IAC and the GB, uh, Dena has asked me to give her a note on what is possible. So I've sent her a note. Let's see how that works out and what happens. Okay, so there are no other questions over to you, Devin. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So I'll be back in about an hour or so, Devin. Yes. It's, uh, right. I think, almost 90 minutes, no, your presentation. 90 minutes. Okay. I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It works. Yeah. So, uh, Rajiv, could you play the video? Or uh, maybe even before we start that, are there any questions before we begin uh, this? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, you can maybe play. Uh. 
just a few quotes from the mother and shri just to kind of bring in their their presence so next so yeah i think uh, when i think of deep dialogue the yearning is how can we have a dialogue with each other by seeing each other as, as souls and you know go at a deeper space uh, to have this uh, dialogue next okay sure so uh, this is uh, a part on the uh, synthesis thesis antithesis and synthesis uh, where the mother says one must try to understand the other person's point of view put oneself in his place and instead of quarreling or even fighting find out a solution which can reasonably satisfy both parties there is always one for men of goodwill and uh, ragu in his presentation refers to couple of uh, you know uh, stories from the indian uh, itihasa and, and mythological system so one is of the samudra manthan which uh, many of you may be familiar with Uh, which is again gives us a perspective that all that's happening here is like a play of forces so uh, while at times we may get too attached to what i am doing and what we are doing but there is also a larger play of forces and uh, deva and asura next uh, as he mentioned he also refers to the different play of energies and the five archetypes of uh, of the five pandavas that he speaks to Uh, that he will refer to next and also why is it that it is only to arjun that krishna kind of gave the gita so what is the the importance of the arjun archetype in really going into the deeper space of dialogue where uh, we are having a dialogue from a deeper space next and uh, in a way it's it's about yes for each of us to find that unity within Uh, this is again a quote from the mother that the unity of humanity is an underlying and existing fact but the external union of mankind depends on man's goodwill and sincerity if you want peace upon earth first establish peace in your heart if you want union in the world first unify the different parts of your being so at some level it is about the mahabharata within us so all these archetypal energy uh, is also within us there is an inner duryodhan in me and there is also inner bhima in me so when we uh, look at this how do we look at also from the the, the battle the mahabharata within next next but uh, when i was going through mother on norwell uh, it was interesting to see that for us there is there is a uh, 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 another call that she is giving uh, which is not just about individual sadhana in this q and a when she was asked what is the difference between the ashram and norwell she is saying the ashram will retain its true role of pioneer inspirer and guide norwell is the attempt towards collective realization which means this building this group soul this collective yoga and in and in that process to have a deep dialogue uh, is uh, is i feel of uh, of uh, important uh, role next so how do i dialogue not only with the krishna within me but also with krishna in each of us and we all know about shri arbindo's alipur jail experiences where he was able to see krishna in everyone in the jailer in the prisoners in the bar so so how do we reach uh, that stage uh, when we want to have this dialogue and another quote by the mother where she says shri arbindo considers the message of the gita to be the basis of the great spiritual movement which has led and will lead humanity more and more to its liberation that is to say to its escape from falsehood and ignorance towards the truth next and uh, which truth uh, is again a quote where she says as long as you are for some and against others you are necessary outside the truth you should constantly keep goodwill and love in your heart and let them pour out on all with tranquility and equality and last and uh, while ragu is not referring to savitri of course in his presentation but to me 
we often hear the current situation of, of war uh, and uh, perhaps it is at some level but it is we are in the age where we are here to manifest something more and uh, and the, the core message of savitri as i see is the victory of love victory of love over death so how do we go through this situation not in the conventional war way but we uh, win with love so with that intention uh, we uh, is 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 i kind of my personal intention for many of us to hold this space of dialogue and uh, with that we kind of uh, start uh, ragu's video thank you ah. can you see it i can see it now super okay thank you right but i can't move it no you have no, to you tell us Everybody. next we move it is that okay ragu you tell us yeah yeah, yeah yeah i'll keep saying next 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 because sure. i have got it organized like that okay yeah so namaste and thank you for this opportunity uh it's been quite interesting to listen to a whole cross section of people and i must say i was uh quite happy with the kind of honesty with which the sharing happened so i hope i can do justice to whatever i've heard yeah can we change the slide please yeah i just wanted to make it clear that what i'm presenting is one view that i've been able to gather through a set of interviews and i think i've covered a fair cross section of people uh both the residents uh, members of the governing body and uh the iac and an assessment is a broad overview statement uh and it's a starting point of a dialogue it is not to be seen as some kind of a final statement about anything can you move next right yeah the fundamental thing i've tried to do in this uh through the whole interview and whatever is not to focus on the content because the content is something everybody knows i've try to look at what is the energy dynamics that underlies the way people are looking at the events which is always something much more permanent because this is what defines culture uh events will come and go but the way people respond to an event is what defines the place and that is what is long lasting right so i've tried to get an understanding of the underlying dynamics which means some aspects of the culture uh, of orobel next right now some of the questions i ask myself na are basically to do with what is the capability of orobel to respond to its current challenges and the way it is responding to these challenges or to enable it to move towards its own stated objectives and goals which is a fairly high level of aspirational uh direction that it has given itself which is actually to be an exemplar to the whole world and show the world how uh complex problems can be dealt with and solved so that's the other frame that i've kept in the back of my mind yeah so there are some things that are very clear one is that up till now there has been a fairly uh considerable and you know praiseworthy level of progress that in individuals have made and some of it came through in the way people shared their own sadhana and in my understanding what has happened is a lot of small scale units which produce world class products and all that have come in and in some aspects of sustainability and so on there's a fairly uh important contribution <coughs> that uh, orville has made next right so what we are confronting today in my understanding is the next level of growth 
which has got to do with a large organizational issue, issues of scaling up and so on. And so whatever I'm talking about is in that perspective. Next. Yeah. Now, one of the critical things that I thought was that, uh, you know, the way things are, are going on right now uh, in Oroville seems to be a, a whole uh, antagonistic process where friendships are getting broken. So it was quite heartrending to hear people talk about how the way the response is happening at present is actually bringing in tensions and sometimes even broken friendships. Yeah, and there is this whole Panchatantra that talks about how to win friends and how to break friends. And the process now seems to be more on breaking friendships than on making friendships. The other thing that I was asking myself was what is the importance of the city? And that seems to be one central issue that's going on. And uh, people like Michelle who might know more than me on this, but I'll has hazard a guess. <laughs> when we look at civilizational collapses across the world, it's fundamentally got to do with central critical cities that collapse. And then the whole civilization collapses. So just wondering whether that's the reason why the mother and Sri Aurobindo have looked at creating a city which is spiritual. Because there are ashrams, there are small villages which have attempted this, but I don't think there has been any city level attempt to create something which is focused on a spiritual evolution. Yeah, so it becomes important for the whole world. It's not just something that's important for the Aurobillians to look at this whole process. <clears throat> yeah. Now, one of the things that happens in these kinds of crisis situations, when people are talking to each other, they end up talking at each other. And it becomes very difficult to listen to the message that is trying to be conveyed because there are all kinds of other filters that come in to the picture. And very often what comes in uh, has to do with the uh, emotional uh, charge. And the current situation definitely is very charged emotionally. Yeah? So one of the ways in which we can proceed forward is to really understand the meaning of dialogue so that there are no ruptures left behind as we move forward. Next. Yeah, I asked myself, you know, what is Auroville as people are talking about it? No? There are so many definitions of Auroville, right? But what are they fundamentally talking about? Yeah, can you just click once, please? So one critical statement is that it has to be a place where all my neighbors are focused on integral yoga and focused on and being inspired by the mother's dream. This is something that everybody talked about. The second is a place where infrastructures work efficiently and will support a city. Uh, now, these two are very important because one is talk talking about some commitment to, a, to an ideal of of divinity and uh, whatever. The other has to do with whether uh, while we are trying to be sacred, our sewage will be cleared properly or not. So this is a critical tension between something very mundane and something very lofty. Next. Right. The second or the third very critical thing everybody is talking about, which is also there in the charter and so on is, is Auroville a place where the culture of the place continuously supports human evolution. Next. The other thing that seems to be uh, something most people are talking about is, is this place aesthetic? And is the place where we work conducive to working well? Is it inspiring and so on? And these four seems to be the tension areas 
in the current discourse. Can you click? Yeah, so what happens is that whenever there are any issues, like right now there's a whole <laughs> something to do with uh, uh, people, land issues and things like that. So immediately there's a huge cry saying, where is the estate officer, where, what is she doing? And all kinds of mails fly all over the place, right? So there's a definite need for uh, securing land, which is articulated right now in very reactive ways, right? The second, can you click again? The other thing that seems to continuously get into uh, a flashpoint is whenever this question about a city is talked about. So it appears that this is not the first time this whole issue is erupted. This might be the second or even the third time this is erupted. So there's obviously something to do with commitment to a large scale building of one part of the of the dream and it is definitely uh, evoking and provoking <clears throat> provoking people uh, very sharply yeah next now the other thing that i'm finding which is what i can contribute to is I don't think the culture as it is evolving right now and is it being displayed right now will help human evolution. There's a lot of antagonism, there's a lot of anger and there also seems to be a, a degree of regression in the way people are responding to each other. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that seems to be a bone of contention is this whole issue of aesthetics and you know how conducive it is in, in uh, Indian thought, you have this idea of Ramyam, which is very critical. So anything you build, which has a sacred direction ought to have Bhogardyam, which is utility, Sukhadarshanam, which is aesthetics and Ramyam. Now, this is a very difficult thing to answer, but there seems to be a constant pull or push about this. So if somebody wants to do something, one of the issues that we brought up is the issue of is it capable of Ramya. So these four seem to be critical pegs on which the current issue of what is Auroville is being articulated. Yeah, And it's obvious that unless all four are coming together in a way that is convergent, in a way that's coherent, Auroville is not going to go anywhere. It will stay in a similar kind of a process most of the time. Yeah. So the overall picture that I get of Auroville when I listen to a lot of people is that it's an oasis within which there are lots of violence. Yeah. Can you just click? Right. And each of these is like <clears throat> one view of Auroville, which is contained within a certain technology that that group has <clears throat> understood and worked on. There's a world view that's created around this. So there are lots of Aurovilles. There is no one Auroville, but there seems to be a, a grouping within different pockets of understanding of what is Auroville. And this comes through, uh, you know, when we're talking to ma many of the people who spoke to me were speaking about how uh, within Auroville, they find that their acceptance in some groups is high. There are other groups in which they are definitely not included. And also the world view that each of these groups present is not convergent. There are definite differences in these and this, I think, is a critical issue because if you have to scale up and take Auroville to the next level, uh, it obviously cannot be at this level because this, I don't think, is scalable, this model. So one has to really understand what might make the uh, make Auroville scalable for it to go to the next level because I think it is stagnating at this level of 
small pockets of excellence. And this has been uh, the state for a long time. Yeah, a number of people use the word war. So I ask myself, what is this war going on? Right? And there are very many ways in which people are uh, framing this. So they talk about, you know, people on one side and people on the other side. So there's one framing that says there are seekers, there are pioneers, and then there are people who come outside who don't understand. Uh, there is <clears throat> statements about spiritual explorers and structuralists. That's another versus. And there's a fundamental statement that says, look, we are all individuals who are not answerable to anything other than ourselves. And then there are people who are playing roles where the system has to operate and the system has to operate for everybody. So there are all these versus kind of statements that are going around. Yeah. And many of the these pockets seems to be also having a certain conviction behind what they're saying. So each of them seem to be saying, look, we have successfully incubated our idea of or our will. This is the proof of concept. Yeah. And this is the way our will must be built. And therefore, a real bridging between these units and an overarching idea of what our will ought to be and what it could be which includes but transcends these small pockets is not clear at all. And then what is also happening is that there is a whole uh, framing of us versus Dr. Jayanti Ravi and depending on, uh, you know, how they feel about it, this she either uh, referred to respectfully or she is referred to as the estate officer or Oroville Foundation, which itself I found very strange because somewhere humanity and an exchange between human beings is lost in the way this whole exchange is happening. Yeah. And I think there is a, a, an issue also of somebody like Dr. Jayanti Ravi, who's worked on huge problems, you know, which which is maybe a hundred times the size of Oroville, having to now look at something of this scale. Because here, each person seems to find a voice and the systemic, the respect required actually for systemic solutions is not coming through. So there's a systemic way of looking at solutioning and then there is this individualistic, small scale way of looking at solutioning and the two are not meeting. And the gap is being dealt with uh, in ways that are not conducive to a very positive culture. Now, what is important and from my point of view is each of these uh, small scale units, uh, Dr. Jayanti Ravi and so on, each of them have something of their learning to contribute. And a dialogue then becomes very critical for us to take the next step. Yeah, the other thing that uh, seems to underlie this whole warring effort in a sense is every now and again, when people confront each other and there's a difference in point of view, mother says or Sri Aurobindo says, is used not as a starting point of inquiry and dialogue, but as the starting point of a debate. So like debate means to use a cudgel and break somebody's head. They're using these statements, cherry picking and throwing it at each other like cudgels. Now this doesn't help at all because I think it takes away from the sanctity of the central charter <coughs> and the core of what could be the basis of dialogue. And I think the real statement that is being made behind it is, I want to do this. I've taken a statement of the mother. This is the way I understand the statement. And this is how I'm going to act on the statement. 
Now, if you start with this, one, there is a possibility of a dialogue. Otherwise, this whole thing of the mother says would make the other person, you know, not be able to challenge anything. And what is getting covered up behind mother said is really, this is how I am using this statement to do what I think is right. So it's actually not a statement of respect, but it is a statement where you're using sacred words or personal agendas. Yeah. So the key question we need to answer today, I think is, can the tug of war become a Samudra Mantra? Yeah, and a Samudra Mantan needs two sides. And there's a whole very interesting story about the Samudra Mantan, about how it happened. Maybe we'll come back to the story later. But in any of these situations, if any side wins, the whole of Aura will lose us. Yeah, so whenever you go into uh, any of these kind of difficult things. Now, my teacher Krishnamacharya would say, you have to check the Nadi and see, ask the question, sadhyam or not sadhyam? Yeah, can you help? Can something be done or not? And his advice was, if it is not sadhyam, tell some nice words to these people and say it's all in the hands of God and quietly step out. Okay. Now, I'm hopeful. I think something can be done okay so what is just, just hold just hold the screen as it is now the structure that i'm using to look at this question of sadhyam or not is drawn from the yoga sutra it starts with by using the word heyam heyam means this is a situation that needs to be avoided yeah and everybody seems to be agreed that what we are doing now is not the way to be, which is a very important thing to start because if there's no agreement on a fundamental dissatisfaction, there's no, there's no energy to change, right? So the question of what is happening now, is it good or not, or not good for Auroville is being answered by everybody saying we need to get past it. They're also using the word inflection point, which I hope they've understood. Because inflection point means we're either going to go up we're going to, or we're going to go down. The graph is not going to remain the same. And while agreeing with most of the stuff, because the way they present the, symptoms, the, the you know, symptoms, right? many of them are also saying that, that these are not new. The underlying tensions and the underlying ways at, by which we are trying to solve problems is not something new. So there is a great sense of urgency that we must solve this soon. The other thing that is a positive thing is everybody swears by the mother's vision of the city. But like I told you, it's got its own little problems, but it's a very positive starting point. And I don't think anybody I met is not sincere in saying this ought to be done, but each of them is clinging to their particular view. Yeah. Can you click? Right. Now, Hana Upayam means what's the way to bridge this gap? Right. So I'm suggesting that while there would have to be a lot of operational things that are put in <coughs> place, this is a time when deep healing is required. Because some of the reactions that I saw and I heard from people are reactions that come from hurt, that come from feeling of being, you know, in trauma. There's a lot of mistrust. There are a lot of entrenched positions. And many of these entrenched positions uh, have behind it a history that needs to be looked at and, you know, gone into carefully. I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. Yeah. And the gap between the aspiration and the reality is seen as quite considerable, but it's always the other person 
because of whom of whom this gap is not being closed and this is one of the critical issues and problems right the other thing that would help us to work with this is the underlying uh, assumption that most people share saying that we are engaging in an experiment and that is the historical ex experiment it's a very critical thing so the idea of an experiment gives us the hope that everybody will say yes my position is not final there is doubt there is openness to reexamine it and that will allow for dialogue because the moment somebody says this is my position and this is the only way it has to be there is no dialogue possible it's not an experiment anymore it's a closed dogmatic space yeah yeah so i tried to model the whole thing yeah and this is the model that uh came up for me yeah there are two ends of the picture in any organization one end is when there are lots of individuals who come into an organization and each of them comes in with a personal set of competencies and capabilities and each person will have their own mind and heart you know set in a certain way what any collective tries to do is to go to the other end which is all the collective competencies converge in a in a positive way and the hearts and the minds become coherent and both are very very critical it's very easy often to just talk about tasks and say if you do a b c tasks together everything will fall together but <clears throat> the, the energy does not lie just in the task the energy lies in coherence at a deep level <clears throat> and heart <clears throat> now the end point which is the aspirational end point is very clearly drawn from the charter yeah but the issue is that each person is being drawn to this charter from specific individual locations so the the meaning that they give to it is different and very often dreams like this have an energy which is directly proportional to the nightmare from which i come so people don't get drawn to oroville just like that there are two energies yeah and this is very critical in the whole process as i'll show you a little bit in a, in a minute yeah so each has a personal aspiration next click uh, and every one of them is a stakeholder in or at least they see themselves as stakeholders in oroville right yeah hold it here so there is one movement where all these personal aspirations and capabilities have to move through an, what i'm calling an organizational process there are other ways of looking at it fundamentally this comprises of tasks to be done policies to be followed processes to be entered into and respected strategies which is long term uh, goals you know stated and transactions clearly understood as how transactions ought to happen right most organizations and i'm sad to say includes or will right now which i didn't expect can you click yeah there's an institutional portion which is continuously investing in how people come together build trust build shared values heal hurt because any process you take any task you set to do hurt and differences of opinion is inevitable but you also need processes where you work with these and heal this energy right in most organizations people like me are called in when hurt has gone over a certain threshold and we need to work with it right the only difference between oroville and those organizations is the last two now the, the world view in most organizations get gets bounded by the fact that most people have agreed on a certain 
a clear purpose which is a very tangible purpose and therefore there is not too much of a difference in world view if there is it is kept outside the organization but a place like oroville all world views have a place and that seems to also be part of the mothers and sri aurobindo description saying everything that is in the world will come here right so dialogue which has to be very in, which is very important in institutional space has to be invested in and i don't think oroville has invested in this space enough which is why there are pockets which are very successful different points of view which different people have but you don't get a coherence when you listen to them at this level there's only a constant repetition of the superficial aspects this is what the mother says this is what the charter says and then what is happening and this is important yeah can you click when dialogue starts right then differences surface so the city business is one huge thing where differences surface and when these differences surface what seems to be happening is people get triggered dialogue completely breaks down so what was apparently peaceful starts getting shaken up and the underlying differences and you know other emotional <coughs> baggage seems to get kicked off so what happens then is the whole process of building a collective gets lost and this is like a a huge wall and people get bounced back and fall back onto their personal ways of looking at things rather than be able to cross this yeah now we'll come back to this because what uh, oroville is trying to do is something unique and very difficult and my suspicion is precisely because there is a spiritual direction given and spiritual aspiration given any failure in a sense to go to a collective is triggering shadowy behavior and deep regression yeah so this is to me the pattern that's getting repeated in oroville and this is in my idea the culture of oroville so at once end yeah there are statements like saying this is what has to be done and it has to be done in my way right and then when you find it difficult to actually deal with consensus building and coherence building you find a problem to solve that seems to be a very important problem to solve but the underlying differences are not solved right and in place of dialogue we are ending up with sadly the oldest way of people engaging with each other i am a victim so and so the oppressor who will be my savior and we we'll look at this a little more carefully as we go on <coughs> yeah and this way of dealing with things and getting into a court room kind of a discussion between people is only going to make things worse and i'm not talking about going to the actual court many of the dialogues i had with people while there was a sincerity that was clear about the where they were coming from there's a clear listing of blames saying this is not being done this is not being done whatever and it's like i am the judge this person is the accused and in my view if that person has to be condemned right now this is you know i found it sad listening to this kind of a very violent condemnation of others one of the things that a lot of people are feeling positive about is the way the dream weaving process happened in their mind this was a good first step so what i've been tossing around and i've talked about it to dena is how do we then help a dream weaving process with healing dialogues which might be critical to go forward otherwise we might solve problems 
but the culture is not going to change. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, can we just stay in the previous picture for a minute? <coughs> yeah, is this picture clear? Because my rest of my presentation is going to elaborate on this picture. I think it is uh, for me. Please continue. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to look at the dynamics, uh, you know, in a little bit more of detail. And I'm going to use my favorite framework, which is the framework of the Mahabharata, because the fundamental idea that I'm bringing up from the Mahabharata is that there are five kinds of power that people have. And it is a wise use of these five that creates a dharmic collective. So I'm starting with Nakula because uh, you'll, you'll see in the end why I'm doing this. Nakula is that part of the mind or that energy that allows us to put service before self. It, it values harmony, it values inclusivity, and it's a power that is very critical for institution building. Now, I'm putting it here first because this is one of the things that is drawing people. The promise of this kind of harmony is drawing people to Aurobel. So what are the functional aspects of this energy? Can you click? Yeah. One is it's an energy that helps building consensus because we want to be inclusive and helps to create a participatory process. This is an energy that helps you to nurture people, want you to volunteer and care for people who work for you and so on. Right? Much of the environmental ethic, yeah, that in Aurobel also is quite strong, is based on this energy of Nakula. Yeah, but this energy also has a dysfunctional aspect. The dysfunctional aspect is when you, the Nakula is very strong, you avoid conflict. So if I differ from you, I'd rather keep quiet, maintain harmony on the surface rather than really talk about where I differ and enter into deep, meaningful dialogue, just in case it causes hurt. <clears throat> so as a consequence, people end up adjusting and accommodating, even at the cost to themselves. Yeah. And what I find happening in Auroville is this is valorized. So I've heard a number of people say, look, the most difficult thing to do in Auroville is to come up with an idea which is meaningful and find it accepted. And they talk about how often their ideas get rejected, what they have to do. Right. And it's then taken back into themselves and say, OK, this is great for my sadhana. Sure, it might be great for your personal sadhana. It is not great for building an organization. Right? The other dysfunctional aspect of the Nakula energy is it creates <clears throat> post kinship groups. And there are lots of these in Audible. <coughs> yeah? There's a shadow aspect to the Nakula energy. And that is, if it gets too held in this, there tends to be very tight knit groups where there's in group solidarity and out group antagonism. Yeah. And there's another side to it. Yeah. Where you draw back in the name of harmony, you celebrate plurality. But this plurality is a superficial plurality. It does not go deep and create coherence. So I'm calling this kind of a culture clan at one end. It's also an ability to create an ecosystem where here ecosystem does not mean ecology. 
ecosystem means different forms of thinking, different heart, mind, collective that can actually work together, respect differences exactly like an ecosystem has birds, it has animals, it has plants, it has all kinds of things. Right? This is a critical energy for that. Yeah. So when you have a system which is either clannish or has not actually progressed to an ecosystem level, but wishes to, there's a whole lot of avoiding of confrontation, even if the other people are violating norms and values. And I know that they are violating norms and values. I'd rather withdraw into my sadhana rather than stand up and say, this is not on for a collective. Yeah. Right. Now the next critical energy is the energy of Dima, which creates arenas. Okay. Now this is a very critical energy for any building of any organization because there's a huge level of commitment, excitement, love for adventure, willingness to explore. <clears throat> and definitely much of the early work done in Auroville has been founded on number of people willing to come in and do something in what they call a brown field. Yeah, so what is the functional aspect of it? One is an ability to commit to an aspiration the moment my emotion is triggered. I don't care about the way. So the charter is my dream. I'm going to come here and I'm going to put everything I have into this. Let me figure it out. Right. So this is where the pioneering energy comes in. And this is what really <coughs> opens up new avenues and new ways of doing things. Yeah. Now, I think this is also the energy that has allowed people to incubate small experiments and allow them to reach world class. Right. The sustained investment and commitment to it. We'll come to the downsides of it also. Yeah. The other thing that it does is it inspires a lot of heroism and romanticism. And I think what draws people to Auroville as volunteers and so on is also the romance of this idea of creating something different and creating something new. Right. What are the dysfunctionalities of this energy? One is, this is an energy which actually holds planning and forethought in disdain. So if you plan too much, people with a lot of Bhima energy become very restless and say, come on, man, let's just go and do it. What's all this nonsense? It's like the Nike ad, no? just do it types. Right? Then the other also critical part is that people become very focused on being self-reliant and you know be able to take hardships and so on so asking for help becomes very difficult and really understanding another person who is in pain or suffering becomes very difficult and everybody is just supposed to be able to get up and walk and handle things by themselves it does not enable collective dialogue Right. The other thing that it does is this energy creates loyal tribal bands. Right. And there is an underlying need for power in this energy. And if it is not expressed clearly in legitimate ways, it gets expressed in all kinds of uh, you know, subterranean ways. Right. And I suspect this is happening in Orwell. So what's the shadow side of it? The shadow side is a statement that I've heard people make. Obviously, they make it of others. One of the statements I heard repeated in different ways is people here say, I dare you to box me. So being a rebel is a mark, is a badge. Right. And there is an underlying rage against anything that tries to limit people's autonomy and freedom. Now, this is dysfunctional and even a shadow because 
if you have to create large collectives it is critical that you accept discipline and rules and law yeah the other thing that it does is there is a certain underlying hate and negative attitude towards anything that is seen as neutral or saying step back and look at things so this energy will push and push for escalation right so you ends up by saying i dare you to stop me and damn the collateral damage and i think we are seeing evidence of this getting played out yeah now the critical way to shift now the first two energies create very good small units yeah it's very essential for startups now the next is the yudhishthira energy which is order structure predictability certainty and so on which is a very critical building block for organization building yeah now the functional aspect of this yeah is that most people i spoke to speak about a recognition that there is a plan that is necessary there is an administration that is necessary and so on right you click right there is also some kind of an acceptance that yes we need to scale up and build something called a city yeah but unfortunately i saw much more of the dysfunctional of the yudhishthira play out rather than the functional in order to one of the ways in which it's getting dysfunctional is i heard this in number of different ways that we say yes to plans but we don't think any plan is going to be taken too seriously so there's no respect for this right and then if you lack this collective discipline you get into functional subunits that end up being like silos that actually don't bridge with each other so the the systemic infrastructure never gets created right the other thing is to use rules right either stated or built up by themselves to block action right so a number of people are talking about how their entry into orwell was very tedious and very difficult because some rule or the other would be pulled out right people have had difficulties in getting homes and so on and so forth right there is another aspect to this which is dysfunctional which is you end up then becoming rigid with rules that you need to apply yeah so whenever like for example what they call the foundation bringing things in is seen immediately as rigid which may or may not be so there's no space for a necessary dialogue and negotiation so intrinsic real rules are seen as negative so that's the shadow right there is a disdain for any attempt to systematize yeah and if you use the book it is seen as power and enforcement it's not seen as discipline it's immediately interpreted as oppression right now lot of people talk to me about issues of lack of integrity but it was all seen in terms of personal pioneering efforts this that right and many of them also said that these may not be you know a uh, negative kind of thing this is simply a lack of respect for rules and regulations that makes them mismanaged in several ways that are absolutely simple important ways of of staying within uh uh you no know, the rules yeah <coughs> and a lot of people talked about how many of the rules that have been framed by the the residents assembly is complied with in very superficial ways 
right? And one of the things that seems to be a common practice is you engage with Auroville in the minimal ways it is supposed to, and then you create your own ways of having private income because not many people are happy with you know, the amount they're earning here and so on. And then there are fudging, there's fudging going on in this, right? And that seems to be sort of taken for granted. Right? And all of this finally ends up in a hate for rules and tradition. So there are a number of examples where anything that is seen as tradition is opposed. Yeah. And this is to me a little sad because uh, you are starting with a, a spiritual discipline. You're starting with Sri Aurobindo and the mother who have obviously invested a hell of a lot in understanding a tradition. And they are taking it forward. You can't take something forward by not respecting it first. Next. Right. And then you go to Sahadeva. Sahadeva is very important to create networks of purpose, bring together knowledge and expertise, go into rigorous analysis and study before you come to conclusions. Right now, this is also in short supply at an organizational level. Yeah. So what are the functional aspects of this? I think each small unit that's got created in Auroville has quite a bit of a willingness to experiment and create valid knowledge. Yeah. Right. And a lot of people who come into Auroville get attracted because of an opportunity they see of building things. But many of them said that my fundamental expertise is not being used, right? I'm qualified in ABC. Now I'm going and teaching a set of villagers. I'm quite happy teaching a set of these villagers and so on. But am I really bringing my best into the place? Right? And sadly, there are lots of dysfunctionalities that you see out here. There seems to be a satisfaction with limited knowledge and craft level expertise, okay, which is how all of them started, right? And a number of people talked about how they have tried to bring in expertise, right? Like for example, time management in some small units or looking at some other competencies which are essential for building a large collective. And they have experienced disinterest and sometimes disdain for this. Yeah. And quite often this lacuna in knowledge is not accepted. So what is happening is some of the people who do have the knowledge are actually not able to contribute from the knowledge they have. Right? And many people who are looking at a larger planning kind of process were very clear, we don't have this kind of knowledge. We need to get somebody else to bring in this knowledge. But for that, we first have to accept that we don't have this knowledge. Yeah. So I think the upshot of all this is there's a glorifying of this back to basics way of life in order. Yeah. So some of the uh, you know, successful projects are all of this type. Yeah. And <clears throat> I don't think there's any collective idea of what it means to build a city. Yeah. And today you have to embrace technology. You have to make technology work with your spiritual aspiration. And if enough study is not put into this, how is this going to happen? Right. So while Auroville is the place where this experimentation can be done and knowledge can be created, which brings together the, the sacred aspiration and how to build a city which is sustainable and so on, this meeting is not happening. And this is why, you know, my own feeling is that, you know, the dream weaving kind of projects have to be brought in to expand into many of these with an understanding of a humility for 
where is knowledge required and how can we internalize this knowledge? And that requires ability to dialogue. That requires ability to say, I don't know. Right? Now, I put uh, Arjuna at the end because he does something special. Uh, he's the one who speaks to Krishna, which means your own divinity. This chapter starts with saying, I want to be the servitor of the divine and so on. So having a dialogue with the divine is not a casual trip. Just, just hold it a minute. Yeah. So what this energy calls for is deep introspection and valuing a Dharma Sankata. Now, when you value a Dharma Sankata, you cannot get into war. You will understand that there are many ways of viewing the truth and you get into dialogue. Right. I think this is an aspirational state in almost everybody I spoke to. But there is a huge gap between the aspirational willingness and the actual. And I think when people view this gap, they're finding it very difficult to own it up. And that's where much of the pushing back, blaming other people and so on <clears throat> is starting. Okay. Now, one of the critical things that this energy enables you to do is to ask questions of oneself, starting from the statement, I don't know. I don't think enough of this is happening at the organizational level, probably happening at a personal level. Yeah. Right. Now, one of the other things that happens when you really get on to this level inside you and in an organization is the ability to see oneself in others and others in oneself. Right? To really understand deeply and to go beyond just empathy into actually being the other person and dialoguing. Yeah? And unless I can do this, there is no possibility of the kind of dialogue that Auroville is wanting to have. You can have organization dialogues that are about issues and problems, but not about life transformations, right? The other critical thing that is capable of being achieved through this energy is a real balance between the masculine and the feminine, right? I think people are trying to do it in their own life, but I don't think it's happening at a larger level, right? The other is building perspective, another possibility, again, I see it only in individuals discussing and individual uh, sharing. I've not sensed a large scale perspective, which is shared and an ability to stay there and dialogue to create perspective, which is very essential before you even create a strategy. Yeah. And again, all of this is, you know, small pockets of examples. So I'm hoping that this can then be built upon, right? The other critical question that I think we have to answer, the Auroville has to answer now is how do we stay with despair and breakdown of mutuality without immediately making it a trigger to blame other people or without it becoming a trigger to get into your own shadows, your own rage, your own sense of betrayal and so on. Yeah. Now, again, you know, this is all available in pockets in individuals. Can you trust the teaching? Or are you interpreting the teachings in ways that are convenient to you? Yeah, it was very touching. Some of the, you know, sharings of individuals was very touching. Yeah. Individuals are also willing to talk about shadows. The fact that, you know, that's a very, very important energy because if you don't deal with the shadow energy and convert it into a positive, you cannot transform a place. And there are enough people who spoke about the shadows, which to me is not at all common. You know, most people I go to, most places I, I go to, very little is understood. And even if it is talked about, it's talked about very glibly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, one of the dysfunctional aspects, which is part of the Arjuna energy, is you listen to so many things, you look at so many points of view, that you don't develop any conviction within, you just feel overwhelmed. I think there's a huge population in Auroville that is here and then getting pushed and pulled and so on. But there's a fundamental feeling of being overwhelmed with the current situation. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that I've heard on and off, on and off is, you know, this whole thing of, you know, are you on the dharmic side or not on the dharmic side and so on. And people using mothers or, or Sri Aurobindo statements to talk about the fact that they are on the dharmic side. Now, this I find extremely problematic because I think we ought to agree that when I read something, you know, I'm giving meaning to what I read. <coughs> the mother is not here. Sri Aurobindo is not here for me to dialogue with them. So any meaning that I derive is a personal subjective meaning. So claiming therefore that I am dharmic and the other person who is quoting ABC from the mother is adharmic is a problematic thing. And I've heard it too many times for me to just say, you know, let it be, it's, it's an aberration. Right? So what does this lead to? This actually leads to dogma. So you sit there, you think you've got the truth and the certitude, but you don't own up to it. You act in ways that are actually rigid. Your own rage is submerged in this and comes through as rigidity. It comes through as opposition. None of which is conducive to dialogue or of healing of the whole situation. Yeah. Right. The other thing that a few people sp stated, which I think is important for us to look at is many of them said, Hey, I actually have a sense of what this whole thing of working through all the problems of the world might be. Right. But it is awesome. The task we have taken up is really, really huge. I don't think we're up to it. I personally think that many people owning up to this will be a great beginning. Instead of saying and covering up this, this fundamental, uh, you know, awesomeness of, you know, how, how am I going to climb Mount Everest? Instead of saying, no, no, I know how to climb Everest. It's an important energy. And not to be overwhelmed by this, but to start giving it some shape and saying, you know, this is what I see. Let's look at it. Let's slowly shape this. Yeah. But if you just get overwhelmed and saying, oh my God, there's so many shadows, etc., etc., you're never going to get started. And I think this has been happening for a long time. Yeah. So I'm just going to put it together in a gist. No? What, what comes through to me is the Bhima type of arch arch no, archetypal energy is invested in, celebrated, and it could be the core of the Aurobillian identity. And if it is, <laughs> we are in a difficult situation because you can't hurt cats so easily. Huh? Right? The Nakula energy, which is important for cohesion, is available in small groups but it is not available as a whole. So it ends up becoming creating nice interfaces and in times when so-called peace, everybody's in their own little pockets, but a cohesion and a coherence is not happening. Yeah, there is not enough respect for the Yudhishthira identity, it's plain and simple, right? And unfortunately, Dr. Jayanti Ravi's core identity is the ability to act and work with large systems, which means a good, you know, very well worked out Yudhishthira identity. Yeah. I think the, the knowledge thing is sporadic, it's held in pockets, right? And Arjuna 
when you click arjuna is only held in individual sadhana right i don't understand where it comes through as a collective sadhana yeah so what does this mean what are the therefore the collective core competencies of oracle right one core competency is a commitment to individual sadhana but even here there are some question marks but yeah there's a great deal of commitment to freedom and autonomy yeah there's a willingness to trust on zone guts which i think is a very good thing right there's a lot of willingness to fail to experiment and to go there and to fail but this is held individually and in small pockets right and there are lots of people who feel inspired by each other and so there's an inspirational quality that is there in all of it right but there are also core inadequacies right one core inadequacy is the ability to negotiate and dialogues with people who have different mindsets and different ways of looking at reality right there's an inability or an in inadequacy in committing to long term plans so that requires a huge amount of yudhishthira energy right setting down policies which are acceptable you can't have a large city without policies and if they are fundamentally seen and held in suspicion how do you build shared policy right peer accountability is a huge question mark and if you have to build the kind of place orobel is talking about peer accountability is very critical my own uh, opinion is that some of the current processes that are happening is because peer accountability has been missing for a long time so this accountability has now come through from the governing body through dr jenty and if it had been worked on we would probably be in a different place right so there is a collective and core incompetence also because of this of this pioneering thing and this strong whatever is how do you heal collectively because you know there's a very interesting statement from the native american tradition which says that all cure happens individually but all healing happens in a community right so one of the critical things that has to happen is to surface collective shadows and resolve them and this is not uh, so easy but it's necessary precisely because orwell has stated for itself this spiritual goal right so i'm going to put this together into another frame yeah which i think is critical because that's the that's the core issue in the dialoguing process that we need to look at right like i said in the beginning there's a lot of clan energy that i see in all of us no yeah so what does the clan energy do clan energy has high in group position like i said but the other is demonized yeah and there are shamanic and superstitious ways of looking at your own truth right and this doesn't help in real inquiry okay so when people regress to this level they symbolize other people okay wait a minute wait a minute yeah and the dialogue simply then descends into victim oppressor savior and fear is what is left behind in this kind of discourse i heard quite a bit of this in my discussions with people yeah yeah right and then you know there's the next level which we talked about which is the arena which is fundamentally tribal which has heroes and followers yeah in this discourse the other becomes a villain and there are tricks and whatever that help you to 
to transform. This is not the real spiritual practice. It's a medicine man kind of a practice, right? And then what happens while experimentation is valid, the whole dialogue, and the discourse becomes a discourse of heroes and villains and colluders, which is quite clearly evident right now. The underlying thing in this discourse is a discourse of power, which is not stated clearly. Right. And then an organization has to move into a clockwork that is very critical to move out of the arena plan into a clockwork if large sustainable systems have to be created. This requires strong structure, uniformity and so on. But when this discourse starts, if it's not understood well, the other is treated as a criminal. Right. And your own understanding of the way out becomes profits, uh, is rituals and so on. And if it's not understood, any practice can quickly be called religious. It can be condemned, which I also one is hearing about. So the discourse then becomes judge, accused and defendant. And the underlying feeling that gets generated in this is contempt. So with fear, with unstated issues of power and with contempt, you cannot build a community. Yeah. The next level which an organization has to move to is the network, right? Where you're bonded by a shared purpose and everybody is a potential resource, right? There might be some competition, but there is a a, a nice way of a rational way of dealing with differences and individuals, right? And the whole group comes together through purpose, through seeking and skepticism, which is an important thing, right? And this generates a sense of curiosity. Yeah. I don't see this as a collective in all of it, right? Then there is the level which we call ecology, which is highly inclusive, pluralistic, relativistic also. Here, mostly what happens is people end up with what is now called eco-spiritualism. And if it's not understood properly, this also generates narcissism, where you pull back. It's a complicated kind of thing. We look at this, but I think this is happening here. Yeah. So this is the space where you find friends and you're able to deal with differences in a friendly way. And there's a context of compassion that develops. <clears throat> I have not heard collective compassion in all of them. Right. And this is the aspirational level where you really understand microcosms and not macrocosm, non-duality and so on. And yeah, you, your dreams are awakened. Everybody is a co-creator and so on. And deep collective contemplation takes place. I have not heard enough to tell me that this is existent in Aurobel. So what Aurobel is standing for is to be a whole on. Where it got stuck in the current issue the way dealing with the current issues is between clan and arena with huge struggle happening to accept the clockwork. Therefore, the rest of this, of the levels of organizational evolution are maybe understood. I don't know, but definitely not acted upon collectively. Yeah, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you go back? Yeah, stay with this. Uh, is this picture clear? Because this is critical to understand if we have to all work with creating an oracle. Yes, yes, uh, yes, it is clear. 
Okay. Right. So I'm going here. I'm going out on a limb. Okay. So I'm doing some speculation on the shadowy energies. I think a lot of people have felt a great deal of hope. Okay. Especially with uh, Jainti Ji. Right. And saying, you know what, there's been stagnation and now we're going to do something fantastic, et cetera, et cetera. But there has also been a feeling of letdown. The feeling of letdown, I don't think ought to be attributed to Jainti Ji or the whatever. It is also heavily influenced by the individual inability, like we saw in the culture of Auroville, a disdain for certain organizational level actions. Right? But unless this is understood, it will keep on getting focused on an individual. It will not go into an examination of the process and how each person is creating this context. Yeah. Right. There seems to be a repetition of this process that many people talked about number of times when there have been attempts to organize and every time there is this, there's been a huge eruption of resistance, anger, outrage, hostilities and things like that. Yeah. In fact, many of the people I spoke to uh, started by saying, look, while this is an event that's happening, this is a repetition of what we have seen before. And then they went back years. Yeah. Okay. This is the thing I already talked about in, you know, symbolizing somebody saying, yeah, you're the person who's bringing in rules. We hate rules. So we don't like you. We hate you kind of thing. Yeah. Now, my suspicion is also that the word accountability and some of the accountability that's being brought in today is mirroring back to many people in Auroville, you know, areas of lacuna. And this is being presented. So unless, you know, there's some resolution here, it will be difficult to have a dialogue because this is being pushed under the table. Okay. Now, I also heard sometimes clearly articulated, sometimes not so clearly articulated, a great deal of despair around where Auroville is today. It has nothing to do with what is happening right now. This is a despair that's been building up for a long time. But this despair can easily be thrown at somebody who's called an outsider who seems to be calling for accountability. Yeah. The other underlying energy that has become a shadow is to say nobody can demand accountability of me. And because of that, the residents themselves cannot build consensus. Because unless there is mutual accountability to things that have been agreed upon and so on, you'll continuously be talking about the utopias. And then my utopia is being opposed by your idea of utopia. Uh, maybe there is some exchange. You go back to your sadhana, whatever you come back is unresolved. And this just keeps staying. Okay. So even a little deeper into my speculations, yeah, going even further out of the limb. There are unresolved feelings of betrayal. Okay, and this betrayal is now being put at the door of the foundation and so on. But I think these are mutual betrayals that have been felt by people and it is not new. Right, so people have come in with a huge respect and love and hope for the dream. They have not experienced this being acted upon by other people, right or wrong, one doesn't know. But 
this has never been resolved. So this sense of betrayal continues in some way and then events come and trigger the sense of betrayal and then this goes and lodges in the external trigger. This lodges in the external trigger, yeah, and then it can't be dealt with. Yeah. The other thing is that after the passing away of the mother and Auroville and or Sri Aurobindo, there's another sense of betrayal, which is the Messiah who drew me into this space is not here anymore. Yeah. And then it's, it's a very difficult thing because anybody who interprets or says that, look, I've discovered something and this is the way I'm looking at the spiritual path will be seen as a usurper, will be seen as a proxy because he's not the Messiah or he be expected or he or she will be expected to be the Messiah, which is again impossible. So what is collective spiritual sadhana? Yeah. If this is cracked, Auroville will do phenomenal things. Yeah. And there seems to be a, an evidence of individuals who have attempted to take leadership, but there have been opposing camps, they're seen as dogmatic and so on, and they're pulled down. Right? So the upshot of all this is a deep double bind that I found many people articulating. Right? Many people have come to that middle space that I showed you in that picture. And then there's an enormous task in front of them. They actually don't know how to go forward and create the collective magnificent city. But after having put in 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, <coughs> I can very, very easily understand and empathize with the sense of despair. What do I do? Where do I go? If this doesn't work and if this is not going to unfold in the form that I hoped for when I came in here, what do I do now? Right? And when these feelings are not, there's nowhere to take this, there's nowhere to dialogue it and so on, they turn into rage. Very, very understandable. Yeah. And I also think in this context of all this, no, unfortunately, uh, Jainti Ji has become the symbol of the bad mother. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just speculating on what are the next steps that could be taken. Right. I think the first simple thing that ought to be done at the policy level is what is an accepted idea of the success of Auroville? Each one has their own little picture. There is no shared idea that these are the measurable steps. These are the measurable things. So if we can move from point A to point B, that's a great step. This is the next step and so on. Without which, if you keep on talking about this magnificent city, it's a vague idea which is not converted into any shared success criteria. This is critical. So every time somebody says you're successful, somebody else can say you're not successful. When you say you're not successful, somebody else can say successful. But you have set the goal post so far. You set the goal post in a place where nobody in the world has reached so far. So there is no comparison. There is no way in which you can concretize this. What is this magnificent spiritual city? Right. So unless there is some way of saying, okay, if we achieve this in the next few years, you've taken a progressive step. Let's try and achieve this in the next few years and you break it down. And it's a movement towards this grand objective. You're going to continue to have this problem, right? I think dream weaving is a good first step. Yeah, but like I said, without a healing energy, just the dream weaving is not going to go anywhere. 
because I've also heard people saying, yeah, 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 dream weaving, fine. But you know what? Maybe these architects came and agreed just now, but we've seen these architects never being able to agree. So the underlying suspicion about a very nice step that's been taken is there. Right? You can't afford that. Yeah? The other thing is also that each of the three bodies here, you know, the GB, the IAC, and the Residence Assembly, have to really understand what are the non-negotiables between each other, what are the boundaries, and what are the responsibilities of each. I think there is a, a lack of understanding here, which is also causing the clockwork space not to emerge. <laughs> Right, And <clears throat> if these are stated, right, you might be able to start rebuilding trust and say, okay, let's collectively do this. You play this, you play this role kind of a thing and slowly step by step start. Because I don't think Auroville can be built without all these three groups coming together. Yeah. It might be a good thing to start investing in non-controversial areas and build forward. <coughs> right? This I already shared with you saying, can you extend the dream weaving to other areas? Because uh, I think a lot of people have been positive about this. Right? And add the healing process, like I said before. Because Undealt with, unowned up shadows is a huge problem. Right? I also think, like I said before, there isn't enough knowledge and in, in, isn't enough execution capability in the resident assembly in of itself. So even if they take decisions and say they will do ABC, I don't think they'll be able to do it. So critical to understand how this capability is built. And if it's not internally available, how can it be rotten and negotiated for? Right? So this is just like a summary of what I've been saying so far. Can we own up both the success and the failures that have happened so far and learn from both? Yeah. The other is clearly to agree on how to deal with the teachings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo and honestly talk about what one understands and how one is internalized and how one is interpreting the teachings. This is very critical for a dialogue to go forward. Yeah. The difficulty is that a lot of the work that has to happen in the dream that has been put forward and, you know, really people have uh, been committed to it is most of it has to happen internally, right? It's an inner sadhana and there is very little understanding across the world of what is the collective spiritual sadhana that can take you there. But one thing is very clearly understood that unless the clockwork level is deeply internalized and the structure that is usually represents becomes an infrastructure, transcending that level is very difficult. So right now, clockwork is looked at only as a structural imposition process. A lot of people have to understand how it becomes an extremely important essential infrastructure which has roles, responsibilities, and rules to be respected. And it's an issue of discipline. It's not an issue of oppression, right? And there is no way Auroville can go forward unless all the stakeholders are part of the experiment. It can't be you experiment and I'll watch, yeah? Now, this is something that I think has to happen through a healing process where there has to be a grieving. You know, a lot of people have talked about how we ha they have not moved in 40 years, 30 years. 
right? Instead of holding it as a rage or holding it as betrayal, you, one has to have a collective grieving and say, look, it didn't happen. Let's, let's own up the pathos that we feel about it. And if you do that, like all grieving processes, you get away from anger, you get away from feelings of loss and betrayal, and you can evolve into another level of being. You can actually go and move and live in a different way rather than be caught with the anger of the letdown of somebody having, you know, like in, in individual grieving, this has been worked out quite a, quite a bit. But I don't think collective grieving is understood. Yeah. And like I said, all of this has to do with understanding the clockwork as an infrastructure and then building on top of that. If it is treated as an enemy, our will cannot evolve from here. Yeah. Lovely. So I guess we're good to go. Right. I just had one question. Uh, uh, Naveen, yeah, please go ahead. There are some people I'm, there are some people I'm seeing on the video who had also had a chat with me. Uh, you'll have to see how they can be part of the initial discussion. Na? Yeah, yeah. I haven't set up the fishbowl yet. So what we will maybe, I'll just explain how we're going to go about it. To start off with, uh, there are a bunch of you who've already spoken to Raghu when he, I think about 30 odd people, if I remember right. So we will give them the first, um, the first um, preference to start off this conversation. So if I may request only those of you who have already spoken to him in the f to be in the this first little semicircle, yeah. So let them get the opportunity to ask the first questions because a lot of what Raghu's presented is in a sense built on what he's listened to from these people. So let that conversation go on for a while. And my request is. Uh, each of you, if you can keep your questions to about two minutes or two and a half minutes, that will be ideal. And at some point, I'm hoping people who are sitting in the fishbowl initially might want to step out of it because they've asked their question and uh, that dialogue has happened. So as seats get vacant here, others can step in and occupy those seats. Yeah? Is, is, is that clear? No. Yeah? What, you know, so... Okay, so. Okay. Okay, okay. So, as I understand the fishbowl, it's basically a dialogue in a smaller circle where, and uh, there's a larger circle that also listens in to what's happening, this dialogue that's happening in the smaller circle. Yeah? So, this is not asking questions, this is a dialogue process. Yeah? So, there is a smaller circle right now that consists those who have had this chat with Raghu already and Raghu, yeah? But it's not only a dialogue between them. At some point, and I'm hoping soon, once you asked, you know, once you feel complete with your uh, sharing and your conversation, that they will be able to step out and create space for other people in the outer circle to step in, yeah? So, uh, what's, what's your discomfort with this? and sit in one of the chairs, either of the opposite uh, perception of reality, and, and, and go and enrich the dialogue between different perceptions of reality. Sure. So, so are where, we are, where are the, our different perceptions of reality here? This is my first question. Well, and how, how do we sit there? I'm hoping we will get there as the conversation begins. So I'll hold you to, I'll request for some patience. Let's see okay, how the conversation fine, fine. unfolds. Maybe we'll get there. Yeah? Okay. Yes, Jasmine. No, it's a conversation. So you place your whatever you feel like placing here. And I request to please keep it about two, two and a half minutes to start with. And then let's see where it goes. Yeah? Uh, last question too. Or rather, whatever. Hans, you had something. 
Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick reminders before we start. Uh, one is more than nitpicking on specific incidents and events. Uh, my invitation and request would be to try and can we look at the larger picture in terms of the culture, in terms of the dynamics that Raghu's underlined. And I mean, you, you, of course, you're welcome to place whatever. But if we start nitpicking on issues of this person did that, that person did that, this happened, that happened, we might get into, you know, uh, I don't know where that conversation will go. But so my request is, can we keep questions to the big picture in terms of the larger uh, statements that he's made about energy dynamics and the culture and stuff of the place. Secondly, um, yeah, we'll uh, try and, uh, you know, let's build on what each, let's build on each other in terms of let's not repeat the same questions. The person's already asked it and that question's over. Let's not ask the same question. Let's, or at least build from what the earlier people have already said. Otherwise, we go back, back and forth on the same thing and others don't get a chance. Yeah? So let's start and we'll take it from there. I'm, I'm not expecting this to be easy, but let's see how it unfolds. Yes. Or maybe, be, yeah, I'll be very happy if it's easy. Yes. <laughs> yes, Saro. Yeah, sure. Oh, but have you already spoken to him before? Well, then please come and sit in the, yeah? Uh, Jasmine, you have also spoken to him before? Okay, great. So, Saro, you're saying you'd like to start. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Well, I've already made some question to comment to Rago on the online section two weeks ago, so I don't repeat them. But I have two comments on the presentation today. One is that uh, when a dialogue on uh, it happened like it has been taking place now, only focusing on the conflictual situation where there is a deadlock, um, it's quite easy to have a reductive perception of Auroville. What is appear in the presentation is that uh, Auroville is stuck somehow into a kind of level of arena, but my experience say that Auroville is something more, much more. And then, uh, of course, uh, for an external person doesn't know Auroville and get the focus on uh, dialogue, it has to be, uh, this impression came natural, but unless we uh, elaborate and we take uh, advantage on uh, what Auroville has been done in this field. It's very important. And for example, in my experience, until recently, uh, uh, Auroville has been very able to make a lot of progress in conflict resolution. Unfortunately, it started with COVID when our community life was disrupted. We have lost this know-how. And when intervention of uh, external authority, we have not been able to recover this now that we had. I mean, I've been in Auroville 40 years ago when there was a big conflict and I was amazed until two years ago at the capacity that we are having to manage our own conflict. So that is one element to take it. The other is you steer a level. Even in this case, it has been uh, downplaying, maybe because of what has been reported came out of the meeting, but Auroville in the past, especially when we relate to the local countries, the local region, uh, has been a great capacity to think about a large system. And so that is us to be recovered. And somehow with the change of administration, where the relation with the external body agency has been centralized, that has been marginalized, this capacity of Auroville to have that type of Udistira energy to think in terms of large system. So that's a comment I heard, sorrow, you make sorrow, okay. Cool, uh, anybody else would like to also share? I mean, Raghu, I, not, I don't have my eyes on you, so in case you want to say anything, just feel free to come in. No, at some I'm point. quite happy, yeah. I mean, I'm presenting a point of view from what I've heard. <laughs> of course, there'll be different points of view and the way to come to any consensus is to listen to many points of view, All right? So I... Yeah, that's Sauro's. We've lost him. Hello? <laughs> okay, B, is that, did you want to say something? Yeah. Raju, can you hear me? No, it's Raghu. Raghu. <laughs> Can't hear me. Good. 
He's offline. Maybe he's hearing, but we can't see him here. Oh, I can see. I see. Well, Naveen said this won't be easy, but I, th I think why not? I mean, here we are. We, we've, we've, we've faced many things over the years, and uh, this is a great opportunity to bring the community together. And uh, I think the, the culture that he talks about, uh, he has given some insights, but most of us, I think, are aware of a lot of what he said already, these various issues that we've had, because it's, let's say, common knowledge in Oroville. After you've been here for a while, you realize what's going on here. And because it's a spiritual community, of course, the inner work that he also emphasized is uh, crucial. Otherwise, we're not going anywhere. So um, what, what I'm just a little concerned about is this notion of dialogue. See, we have to understand, I would understand dialogue is not a couple of people talking about these things. It's a round table. So in, in Oroville, where we have a round table where all, as he said, all the stakeholders can come to the table or at least enough of the stakeholders that represent or are somehow connected to the various elements that are already in the community uh, can talk together in a very uh, understanding and civil way and talk about the way forward. Now, an interesting thing that um, just when Devin started out the introduction, he said, you know, I, have a, I had a little problem because, or." I, I was hurt because my mentors, uh, when I came into Oroville, are now on opposite sides or they disagree. Well, I'm one of his mentors and uh, also the, his other mentor, I don't know if he's, he's uh, really on the other side, but he's done some things that have uh, alienated uh, other people. So. I, I, I said to Devin, you know, he and I can talk any time. And we already talked a few times. So the people have been in Oroville for a while, they, I think they can still talk to each other. And this, this, this question, he talks about the bad mother. You see, those things uh, are things that uh, we have to let go of. We, we, can't, we can't characterize the battle or the so-called battle, this, is, uh, this has to be uh, on another basis, and we don't use those words. We don't say the other side. We don't say the fake working committee. It's a working committee that was set up under certain conditions that uh, I don't agree with and other people don't agree with, but we can talk about that. But we don't use the language. We have to get to the right language. And so I would say the right language for is not dialogue, the right language is round table, everybody at the thing, everybody on an equal playing field, including Jayanti. Jayanti is very easy to talk to, and she's very open, and I don't see why anybody can't talk to her. I don't know. Raghu, can you, can you hear me? I just got in. I heard the last few things you said. Uh, well, B, I'm I, hoping you can hear me. Can yeah, you people I can, hear I can me? I can hear you perfectly. And also, I okay. want to thank you for uh, you know this incredible work you've done. I mean, it's amazing. And but as I said uh, while you were not listening, uh, many people know already what many of the things you have said, and we're ready to take that into consideration. And the way you analyze the culture of Oroville, there are a few things left out that we could talk about. But that culture is very strong, and that culture is going to bring us through. So I wouldn't, there's a little bit of a pessimistic ring in what you've been presenting, but that may have come to you from the people you talk to. So I'm not, I'm not putting it on you, but I, I, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really grateful that we have this opportunity, and I hope we can meet again. But other people want to talk here. There's a lot of people here who sure. want to to dialogue and be yeah. in a round table with you, the fishbowl or whatever you want to call it. Um, very briefly to just build on that, I think the infinite uh, 
richness and variety that is there in Oroville doesn't get easily summarized in any presentation. It is so rich, it is so varied, and it is, that's why it is so potent for future manifestation. And uh, as B said, you know, you have met only maybe 30, 40 people, but we keep meeting even now after so many years, new people, new stories, new perspectives, and it gives new hope. Uh, there is something that is building up on a different level than what we see outside. And maybe even the outside shocks have in some ways helped us to go deeper and faster on that plane. But uh, what is happening is really, really tangible for many of us on that other level. And uh, I, I, hope, I am full of hope and full of certitude in that we will be overcoming this stage and, and living our true unity together. One thing that I, I mean, the many things I have uh, seen during the thing that I would like to reflect on, but there is not time for that. One thing that I do want to say is that when you said that there has been always an opposition to an authority, maybe it's uh, a time frame when the real authority of the mother had receded in the background and came this human authority after that human authority. And I think Aurovillians are very, very, not only open to, but they are hungering for the divine authority. So we are not against authority. We are against sort of limited lower authority. That's the thing. Um, in my understanding, um, the higher is not an authority, it's an inspiration. So, yeah, I wouldn't use the word authority for something like that. <clears throat> I'm using the word authority very clearly in the terms that you were saying is a human authority or whatever. In a fishbowl, one would probably have a conversation. Can I, can I say yeah, one word? Yeah, of course. Okay. okay. Yeah, of um, course. It's nice that you make a distinguish between authority and inspiration. Um, the way Auroville started, she was the authority. She was the human authority here. And that's not a time that is easy for, for anybody to grasp. But fortunately, many people even now do feel her close. We are in contact with the mother, and it is not an occult thing with an occult group. It's, it's a deep living experience of many Aurovillians, and I think that's what keeps us together and, and looking for that authority, that real authority. So I'll come back to the word authority, but I'm not sticking on that word. I was just, you know, I was just saying where, how, how I'm using it, yeah? not quibbling with the way you're using it. Yeah, thanks for that. There's a lot to take in. It was the first time I heard you uh, this recording, so a lot to take in. But the, the questions that uh, are the steps forward, two of them I saw there. One was about uh, reconciliation dialogue, and the other one was around uh, what are the responsibilities of the three bodies. Uh, so my question really is, what I see here is, to use the war analogy, we need a, a ceasefire. And uh, because there's a, the way I see it, there's quite a lot of power being exercised arbitrarily. And I don't see how you can have dialogue in that context. Maybe you could comment on that. No, I've, uh... I don't have any difference with what you're saying, so long as there are, you know, these differences and the tonality of us versus them and all that, you can't have dialogue. I agree 100%. That's what I'm saying. So in this context, what has happened is a fall back into a certain kind of discourse, which is not going to be helpful. 
I'm not asking X or Y to be responsible for it specifically, but this is the context in which you see yourselves today. You have something to respond to? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, what I, what I really I was specifically wanted to ask you is around the, the exercise of power in this moment issue, where a lot of people are feeling that power has been exercised arbitrarily. And sure. so how can one have a dialogue, a dialogue in that context? Uh, see, my understanding is this, that whoever is exercising authority or whatever, the moment I start describing that person as a demon, pers the moment I start describing that person as an oppressor and so on, there is a dynamic that's getting set up, right? So when words like demonizing happen, then something is pulling the person's insides back to a very clannish, fear-based level. Dialogue cannot happen from there. Right? Or when you get into <clears throat> who's going to be accused of what, then you set up an adversarial context. There cannot be a dialogue. There is no starting point. So there has to be work at several levels. Now, uh, you know, each of us has to look at it and say, where am I getting my perceptions from? Right? And then there is a possibility of a dialogue. So what I'm stating here very clearly is there is somebody, the secretary here, who's playing a role. Right? And a person who plays a role is playing a role on behalf of a systemic reality. Now, how do I start a dialogue with somebody who's playing a role if I start with the idea that so-and-so is demonic or so-and-so is an accused and so on? It's not possible. Right? So, I'm not saying X or Y or this side or that side has to do something about it only. But this is a reality that I'm hearing when I'm listening to people. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just also, uh, there are a couple of chairs here empty, so those who are outside want to step in and be a part of this conversation, feel free. And if there are people here who have already spoken and would like to step out, that's also great. Uh, so Jasmine would like to go and then I'll bring it to you. Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for this uh, immense work that you have done. And um, it's a presentation for me up to a certain point of watching it was very, very rich. And I felt, wow, if maybe two years ago, this presentation, I, we had collectively seen this presentation it would have been a great starting point for introspection, for changing many things. And I hope this can still happen because, I mean, for me, it's the first time I've seen it. And uh, it has been a lot to take in. I still, I would love to see it again. Um, at the same time, I've got more and more the feeling that with all the beautiful insights and the precious insights, there are gaps that are very significant and serious. Um, I'm not going to, I'm trying to stay away from mentioning any names or per per people in particular. Something I've learned quite deeply in, in the South African process is that it's really important to play the ball and not the person. I think that helps a lot in depersonalizing. At the same time, like others here, I have stumbled and tripped over the concept of Yudhishthira the way it was interpreted. Um, Yudhishthira being the authority and the human authority, we know well in Auroville, as has been pointed out, that like Mother said, the Auroville has one single authority, and that is the divine consciousness. And whoever is closest to that divine consciousness will 
automatically, of course we've struggled with it, but ideally automatically will be in a position of human authority as well. Now, when we get an external authority, which uh, is always is never easy because somebody comes from outside and does not know or will, the first thing I would expect is for this person to have the humility to get to know Auroville. It's certainly a very difficult position to be in. It takes a huge lot of integrity and wisdom and listening. You have pointed out some of the dysfunctional aspects of Yudhishthira and some, and I think we have witnessed some of those also some of the shadows. One shadow that I have not seen in the presentation and I don't know if it fits into the scheme is if we remember Yudhishthira, what happened. He is the one who is actually at the origin of the war because through some, I don't know, personal attachment, addiction, whatever it was, he gambled away the kingdom. And that is an aspect that uh, many of us have been and are deeply worried about, that Orville is in that danger right now. And Yudhishthira has a pivotal role to play in that. So no, I would that's like a possibility, to, sure. I would like the to more, suggest... The more, yeah. tight, the more tight you are, the more you think you know and all that, the more the shadows play up. Sure. And dialogue so we need to, the, yeah. yeah, so we need to understand how to confront this, no? Dialogue, round table is certainly the way we have all been wishing for and working towards as much as we can. But as you said, dialogue is only possible if one person does not feel accused in the first place. Of course. We have of people course. in our in very uh, positions of responsibility who have been accused, they have been slapped with I FIRs. Yeah, I know that. I know that, Jasmine. So that in itself... I've heard that, I've heard that many times over and over again. Sure. So if I may make a suggestion, is that that would be a condition to have those threats removed to even start talking about dialogue so it becomes possible. Yeah, I was, would also like to say that in confronting and healing collective shadows, I do not believe that it can be done with the force of JCBs. I think I'm done. Yeah, thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Maybe I sit here so I can see. Hi, again. Um, this is the second time I see the presentation and every time uh, I have new insights. So thank you for your work. I find it uh, very balanced with maybe a few exceptions where you sound to me a little bit more uh, on one side than the other. Um, and I, I think I asked you last time we had this uh, video call if after your presentation to the governing board uh, and the International Advisory Council, uh, what was their reactions, if they were open to your suggestions? Because um, I, I personally am very open to a dialogue, but as uh, someone just pointed out, uh, you have to have uh, all sides uh, willing to sit on a table. And, uh, and if I looked around today, I don't see many of, let's say, one, particular side. I see many of the other particular side, maybe most, of, if not all. And um, and also in the past, you know, when there was a conflict between, in the working committee, there was an attempt by the Euroville Council to, to find a solution among the components of the members of the working committee. And there was a refusal. Many different options were proposed, but uh, uh, some people, those who then uh, created uh, what we can call the governing board uh, working committee, I call them the unreal working committee, but I've heard that it's better not to use uh, fake or whatever. But let's say the governing board working committee. And um, 
they simply refused to sit uh, uh, around the table. So I wonder how we can start a dialogue or a round table if people don't come when they are invited. Because I understand sometimes uh, uh, I'm a member of RAS, no? and uh, we, have, we are seen by the both sides are taking sides, which is honestly not the case. We try our best to be uh, at the service of the whole community. Uh, really, I feel myself, uh, all of them, as brothers and sisters. I have uh, close friends in both sides. And um, you made a point about neutrals, which is very interesting, because uh, I have also many friends who are neutrals, who don't take side, and, uh, and they are demonized. So not only one side demonizes the other side, both sides demonize these poor neutrals, which are simply, uh, they want peace. Uh, because there is the, the, these extremes are, are uh, into a war, and there are civilians who are uh, suffering. And uh, I'm sympathizing with them because I'm, uh, I feel uh, one of them. Um, so my question is, what was the reaction of the governing board? I heard that you wrote to them, so maybe uh, if you, what you foreseen from their um, side, because uh, you said the three bodies have to agree on responsibilities. How? Because I see now a governing board which says, basically, we can do whatever we want, and uh, work out on accepted criteria for assessing progress. Who has to do it? Because for me, as the resident assembly, I mean, Auroville has to be built by Aurovillians. I, um, so dream weaving can be can be a good uh, way to move forward, but is this accepted? So I think I stop here because I might have many more questions. But yeah, I share I share many of your questions, Giovanni. I don't think I have answers now, but what I'm hoping for is this: that you know this group, neutral group or whatever your group you call it, who are interested in dialogue. That's what I've I've told the governing body, not the governing body actually, DENA, because my interface is with DENA, saying, can we start with 25, 30 people who are interested in understanding dialogue, first of all? Because I don't think we're ready to have what you're calling the warring people come and sit and have a dialogue. We're far away from that, right? There has to be some understanding of many things, like What's the framework in which we understand, like I said, organization development? What stage of development are you at in Oroville? I'm not saying that my presentation is accurate. Okay, let's be clear about that. Because my understanding is there is an outside in view of a reality, there's an inside out view of a reality. And when both of them come together, more or less, you get somewhere close to a reality, you're never going to understand exactly what it is. So you've got to work with that. I don't know. Let's find out. That's one. Thank you. Yeah, just, just a minute. Second is, I have no doubt in my mind. I think it was very clear in my presentation. If it's not, I, I'm going to try and make it clear. The governing body has to be part of the experiment. Right. In my understanding, <clears throat> a lot of the issues have happened because the governing body has not known its role. It's either been too far away or now it's too close. There is a distance, right? Now, each of these three bodies have to really understand how they are part of an experiment because that's the starting point of Auroville. Right. So if if I'm requesting people, for example, from the resident body to say, can some of you start with, I don't know, I know something I don't know. I'm going to request the governing body also, or whoever is representing that to say, can you come to the table with, I don't know. But some context has to be created before that happens, Giovanni. You can't just jump from where you are today into a so-called dialogue it will only deteriorate into exactly what is happening now. That's what I'm saying. There is so much of the clan and arena discourse that I'm hearing. So little, there's a wish 
is a very high wish for what I'm calling the ecosystem dialogue. Holonic, I think, is very, very far away. So let's be honest about that. Right? So what is it that will make it possible for us to be plural, to accept differences, and not fall back on narcissistic, I'm right? That's a huge step. It's not an easy step. There are very few people who've gone there. And attempting to go there is a phenomenal adventure. I really wish you people will show me the way. And I'm very serious about that. That's why I'm putting in this time. That's why we are here too, eh? with our time. Yeah, and that's energy. why we are here. So let's see what can be done. Thank you, Johnny. Okay. Just, just, just one thing. It's like one of the first things that was requested for us, from us for joining or if it was goodwill and the goodwill for everybody. I think that's my, my motto still and also the deep wish to be able to rejoin and reconnect it and make a synthesis in the next step forward. That's just what I wanted to tell. And a lot of my questions were answered, still not like how would we get everybody on the table? How would we be in the rest, in the in the right attitude to, to listen and to step forward? And because I can't even, and I don't want to think about sites anymore. It's over. I've never been, been able to do that, and I really don't want to do that. But I care deeply about the disconnection. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Raghu. Thank you so much. Uh, I am Bindu. I haven't had a chance to meet you before. Uh, very briefly, actually, I've been here all my adult life. And a few comments from what you presented. Uh, one is uh, conflating the Yudhishthira archetype with Jayanti Ravi to me is actually quite problematic because one of the thing about Yudhishthira archetype is that it's somebody who's very, very just. And, uh, you know, when you use visa as a threat of your power, that's not just. And it's just a very quick thing of, uh, it actually really breaks, uh, strikes us at our human unity because you make a division between foreigners and Indians like me. Uh, that is one. The second thing... Can, can we, no, let's, can we just look at this carefully? Sure. Yeah, let me explain an archetype. Yeah, a Yudhishthira archetype is somebody who knows how to use the book. You're confusing with the stereotype. I said this before we started. Now, I can use the book in ways that are constructive, I can use the book in ways that are destructive. But it's a re simple reality. Here is a person who is a bureaucrat who really understands how to use the book. That's the Yudhishthira archetype. Go back to my presentation. Okay. Right? Hmm. And if you want to really look at the Mahabharata, we'll have a long discussion about it. Sure. Yeah, Bhishma also is a Yudhishthira archetype. Okay? There are times when Duryodhana is also a Yudhishthira archetype. Vidura is a same archetype. Look at how differently they use their ability to state what is just. So can you people understand that you're dealing with somebody who is excellent at using the book? Uh, which book are right? we talking about? <laughs> Not the charter. <laughs> that she goes by. No, go. she's a government official. She's given a book. She has to play by that book. And she will play by that book. Uh, now, demonizing. Just a minute. Now, demonizing the person who's using the book doesn't help, no? I don't think any of you us actually to... doing that. Uh, that is also... 
Um, no, I'm come not on. Oh, okay. Come Maybe on. you have talked to other people, and I yeah, haven't. Yeah. Sorry, I take I've that back. Talked to a number of people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've heard terrible words mm -hmm. being used, but there is no starting point if I don't understand how a person is playing a role. You're dealing with a person playing a role. Uh, in which case, can we go back to the fact that? none of us in terms of a process have actually then asked what is the role of Orville Foundation and the three bodies. So, That's exactly what I'm saying, no? But uh, That the okay. three bodies have to come to a, an understanding. What's your role? What are your negotiables? What are your boundaries? Okay, and so then, we're accepting that she's And then something can, Yeah, I very clearly put it up there. Okay. Okay, right. thank you. Now, yeah. Unless, right, unless that, that is clearly stated, how do you start? Right? And look at another point of, of Yudhishthira. If you and I don't agree on what is the measure, what is the scale? Right? One of the most critical things for this archetype, which is the book, which is rules, is the scale. Is there a shared scale? There isn't. So one person is using one scale to say, we are doing this, we are doing that. Somebody is using another scale. How can you move past this when you have three clear stakeholders? There are actually many, many. You know that and I know that. Each of whom has a different scale. Right? Now, many of the critical words that are being used mean completely different things to people. Right? You just saw what happened, na? The way I'm using the word authority and the way you're using the word authority, to me, the moment you get into a deep spiritual understanding, there is no authority because there is no person there. So that's my understanding. Right? So unless there are some things like this, which are shared and clear, there is no starting point. Okay. Uh, which uh, does bring to another thing which is being very expressed with a lot of pain here. Uh, dialogues are healthy, they are needed for that community to heal itself. Uh, but a dialogue happens only if there is deep listening where it changes the two of people course. in a dialogue. Of and course. so we're actually in a stalemate here where of people course. are not and we don't know that's how to the, get out that's of this. That's the main picture. Na? See, if you go back to my presentation, please look at it again. That's my fundamental thing that you start a process of dialogue for real dialogue to happen, especially in such a critical thing like you people are talking about, you put your lives into something, right? So when there's a difference of opinion, yeah, shadows are bound to play up. Fears are bound to play up. I'm seeing you people getting bounced back into personal sadhana at that point of time. And what I think you're doing, we can dialogue this. This is very important to dialogue is collective shadow is being taken as personal shadow and treated as my sadhana. Over and over again, I hear people saying the most difficult thing to do in Auroville is to collectively do something. And what they quote to me is a lack of ability to go further beyond the point. So what do they do? They go back and say, this is my sadhana. That's great for my sadhana, personally. But to get to a collective sadhana, we have to cross that barrier. And the kind of listening you're talking about is not easy. Um, yeah, sure. All of yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, just it's not easy at all. Uh, yeah, no, we know that. Just a couple of uh, observations. Um, actually, uh, do you want to go, Hans, first? Uh, yeah, sure. 
Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I think that's very important, the healing and the dialogue and uh, the wonderful propositions you do to, for, for us to go through that. <coughs> I wanted to speak about another aspect. I question whether inclusivity is actually uh, the thing. Um, I, I, I believe that if we have a representative group, I don't know, five to 15 people, maybe Mother mentioned this also on our governance, um, they need to go through that process. If you have too many people, it's not going to happen. Gonna, of course. And we have enough wise people in this community. Maybe we cannot be so arrogant to say they are the authority of the mother's truth. But many people are close enough, especially the elder ones. No, They are somehow been here longer, they are wiser. And they can take it up, I feel. Because the governance uh, is uh, not about including everybody in democratic processes, I feel. And our collective sadhana is uh, really a mystery. And we are far away from it. And it's not going to be uh, with meetings and uh, processes. And a collective sadhana is for the future. And meanwhile, we can navigate. Uh, but this is a great mystery. And I think already if we have a small group of people, maybe that's what the RA is, or maybe the working committee should be, I don't know. You have a group of people uh, who are willing to go through the experience of intuitive intelligence and make, make decisions and have the authority. Because right now the authority went to something else, but we need that authority, otherwise we're not gonna get anywhere. There's not gonna be one Absolutely. step towards this beautiful city dream and the plan and uh, that thank you i'm a bit like so no, i agree with you 100 <laughs> percent yeah yeah thanks Hans. actually i'm also just gonna sit here as a resident and share something <laughs> yeah i sure. just want to briefly disagree that we do not demonize the other one reason why i think i'm a neutral is because i see enough enough labels judgments and uh, 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 worse thrown at each other on both sides. There are, part, there are WhatsApp groups, there are Telegram groups, there are all kinds of groups where um, there are, the choices of labels are used. Yeah, and I have, uh, I may not agree with everything the secretary does, but the last thing I've heard, I have rarely, uh, it's been a while since I've heard anybody refer to the secretary as the secretary. There's always an adjective along with that. So let's leave it at that, yeah? So it's, I think, I think it's important to self-reflect and look at how have I contributed to the conflict. And it's not just always the other. There's a lot of personal responsibility here as well we need to take. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I've spoken already. Um, but I can't help making a little counterpoint to the, what we've just heard about demonizing, about uh, the lack of readiness, like that right now the fractions, the two sides are so entrenched that they cannot dialogue. Personally, I'm part of several online groups and uh, there have been meetings happening every single week and all are welcome. These meetings have reached a depth and a maturity where I think we all have been very deeply touched by what has been said and it is completely different from the reality that has been described here. There is a sense of spiritual depth, wideness, and acceptance, and certainly not the demonizing that is being claimed here. So as usual, Auroville is very diverse and you can find anything you want, but I just needed to bring this in. And I wish that more people could actually come and, and witness and, and be part of that. Thank you. I get it again? Shall I? There's a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have an observation and a question. Uh, if uh, to nourish uh, a culture of dialogue is uh, one of the main point, why this uh, presentation was not uh, shared uh, uh, with the residents' assembly at the same time as it was shared with the Auroville Foundation and um, I don't IAC. know. That was my recommendation. 
That was your recommendation? Yeah. That was my recommendation and my request. <laughs> hmm. And that was my understanding initially and in the last minute it uh, changed. So don't ask me, <laughs> I don't know. Well, this comes as a surprise also to us because... Well, I, no, I, I don't know why it's a surprise because Devin was part of this whole thing of trying to organize it and see how it can be done. So it was, the, the whole process was, uh, you know, going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm not the deciding person there. So who decided? Because if the three bodies have to start a dialogue, uh, make a healing process and uh, start to feel in a, a level of mutuality, it would have been uh, greatly appreciated, at least from the residents, uh, to have this opportunity. And because, me. because not, just, not just from the residents, from me too. Yeah. That if you really want to make a start with this, you need to have all the three together listening to what is being said. And then have a discussion because many of the questions you people are asking, it's not for me to answer. Yes, and we don't know also how was it uh, received by uh, the governing board and the foundation and the IAC. We don't know what was the exchange, so we have no feel. There was very little exchange. You can ask me that and I'll tell you whatever I know. There was very little exchange, uh, okay. right? We don't have to make a mystery of it between you and me. You, know? you ask me a question and I'll tell you whatever I know, okay? And, and So I made the presentation. Mm -hmm. And then I said, lovely, I understand. Then somebody else, HP said, yeah, I've been in organizations and I understand what you're saying. And Gabby came up and said, I really understand how difficult it is to deal with shadows. Right. And Michelle said, you don't have evidence for this or that. And you know, I don't have evidence because that was not my charge. Somebody told me something. I put it together in a framework. It's not for me to say, you know, so and so right or so and so wrong. Those were the only responses. Right? Can I? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the dream weaving in the presentation also many times, and I don't know if it uh, could be a next step to, to meet the dream weaving team and bring the dialogue also. Uh, as a next step, as the future that we are trying to plan. Sure, sure, of uh, course. Because but, but I'm seeing something else, yeah? I'm seeing a need for, you know, what, what I've suggested to Dana is heart weaving that grows with the, that goes with the dream weaving. It's very easily, it's very easy to go in the mind and say, you know, we want harmony and, you know, have those wishes but to actually touch heart to heart without the shadows that are lying in your heart getting triggered is not that easy. Yeah. Okay, that's the reality. Okay. So let's not run away from that reality. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think we need to add something more to it. I think it would be greatly appreciated if the dream weaving could be given a practical chance because I think the community also feels the need to have uh, some grounding as well. At the same time, in uh, yeah, yeah, parallel. Yeah. That's what I've suggested. If you listen to my presentation, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that it ought to be extended to many other issues. But just the dream weaving will not work in my understanding unless there is a work at a deeper level. Okay, Devin. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, I'm just responding to the question on uh, the joint meeting. I think till the last minute uh, yeah, we were we wanting know. to do it together. Uh, but uh, what we heard is that there is 90 minutes and we don't want uh, at this point to have a discussion with the community so we did tuesday, we tuesday we did with the you did with the gp and wednesday we did with the residents so i think it was a decision then taken by either the foundation or gp chairman we don't know we heard from a foundation office 
So, uh, so that was a response to that. And uh, I feel uh, this aspect of sadhana, uh, especially the collective sadhana, uh, and even in chairman's speech, he spoke of, yes, Aurobillians have the freedom, but freedom of a sadhak. Yeah. Uh, and so how do you suggest, uh, as, a, as a collective, uh, we come together and have a common understanding of because it's it's so subtle and it's uh, it's kind of and yet it's it's the centerpiece of why we are here. It's 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 very of difficult course. to say who is where in the sadhana. But when of course. Uh, so so you have any suggestions on how can we go about um, or is, is that even is that even needed to to have a shared understanding? I think it's needed. Or, I think it's needed. I share I I share what Hans was saying. So I'm suggesting that we need to start with a small group of people who will, you know, work together, work with me, if you want me, and we work together to see what can be the contours for it. I'm not going to come in and say, I know. I don't know. I have some ways of approaching it. I'm sure there are other people in Auroville who have an idea of how this could be approached. Right? So I think it's important to start from here and form a small group that will start looking at what are the possibilities. With the full awareness that we won't come up with anything meaningful, man. Then so be it. You guys are an experiment, right? So we really step into that experimental space. You can only step into that experimental space if you start with, I don't know. You can't get into an experimental space with, I know who's the screwball. It's not possible. Right? You can't start an experiment saying all of you must be there on the table. You can only start an experiment of the kind we're talking about saying who wants to join. Let's look at it. And volunteering is a huge part of your own ways of working. I think it's a phenomenally important part. Organizations get screwed up because there is no voluntarism. It's all carrot and stick. So you've got huge things going for you. You couldn't take the next step and how is it possible? Okay, thank you. Raghu, uh, you probably should let me, let us know about five minutes before your uh, tank is... No, 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 no. Okay. I've given huh. an open time to Devin. Okay. I'll stick to my commitments, man. Don't. So you're me. saying however long this takes, we'll keep going? However <laughs> long it takes. Okay. And it's not going to be over this evening. Of Na course. Naveen. Of course. Okay. Fair enough. Unless yeah. yeah, unless you think some magic is going to happen, it's not going to <laughs> sure, get over sure. okay. <laughs> any time soon. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, Raghu. Yeah, uh, thank you for this wonderful analysis. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, like uh, Veda, when it was not, uh, accessible to the public, it remain in the cell. And now, fortunately, it is out for everybody. And uh, the, all the deep knowledge that you have come up with in your presentation, if it is uh, maybe accessible to, for future reflection or uh, review, um, study, that will be good. That is one aspect. And I, uh, when Giovanni said about the neutrals, I actually um, resonated with that. You see, if you take a side and somebody is not in your side, that means you are on the other side. And that means the neutrals are considered either <laughs> pushed from this side and the other side. And then somebody says that if you are uh, not our side, then you are the other side. You are not neutral. So it is the uh, suffering is there, but it is part of the journey. Uh, and because in our will, we are in a big confusion now, and uh, it is part of our journey. Uh, I accept it like that. And uh, the main thing that I wanted to say is that uh, during mother's time, when she spoke about Auroville and everything that is in the agenda and question and answer, 
there was no government aspect there and she had not talked about the role of government in the manifestation of Auroville. That means I will uh, in uh, uh, image I would like to give but which is not the best one um, uh, nothing other comes but you can translate in a different way is that we wanted to have romance with the divine and we came and we uh, decided to become Aurovillian and uh, but uh, there was no third point but unfortunately or fortunately a child took birth and what the child that took birth which was younger than us and what is its nature, what is responsibility, what is identity that we didn't know and mother didn't talk about that and we couldn't, uh, I don't want to blame anybody, it is all part of us no uh, old timers should be blamed for that but the situation is that then we managed in a way that the government had to come and that we invited new entity and the roles were not identified in a spiritual way that the mother would say and now because it is part of the Auroville uh, entity somehow we have to deal with it and accommodate it and we need to maybe reach in a state of psychology or spiritual uh, state where we don't need the government role at all but for that to achieve we have to have such a deep sadhana or endeavor or whatever psychology I don't know I'm contemplating on that but at this moment unless we realize that there is an entity who is uh, empowered or entitled to play a role and we would never achieve uh, any harmony and uh, that is my personal view and um, how to have all together because we say that the government is outside and it cannot, shouldn't do anything how can they do? They have been given the power and we have called them uh, I don't know, you could correct me just my perspective, uh, understanding I see it in this way Sir, I, I agree with you and I am talking about the current reality you have these three entities and you also have the overall thing of uh, uh, an experiment or a dream you have to learn how to work with this and my understanding is that some of the hurts that led to the government coming in have still not healed because when I spoke to a lot of people they went right back in history and talked about what they felt right so some healing has not happened for a long time that's my understanding I'm not quoting it from my head it's what I heard a lot of people say right the second thing is <clears throat> I'm not here saying I know anything about the divine okay I'm saying I have some understanding of what it means to be human that's the first step once a collective understands how to be human which means no division so on and so forth then maybe the next step is to really understand your ultimate aspiration the next step is how do we become a human collective the next step is not how do we become a, a spiritual collective that's far away Uh, because in a human collective, lots of things that are happening now won't happen. Yeah. So, you know, the kind of stories I've heard, the kind of ways in which I've heard these stories don't happen in a human collective. They happen in places of war. How many times I heard people who speak to me use the word war? That's not my word, man. That's the word I heard most people use. So uh, it pains me to hear something like that from an auto will. Yeah. Because imagine, I mean, this is something very serious, huh? You guys are sitting there to give me hope. 
That's your promise. Okay, and I'm not joking. Many of you have gone in there and said, all you guys and right, many of you have said this in writing and sent me those papers. The world outside is so lousy. I'm part of that lousy world that we in Auroville are such great people. We are trying to do this great experiment. Sure. Please show me the way. Right? And what I'm hearing now is not the way. And you're doing things I'm doing. I have to deal with my villages around me. I have to deal with X, Y, and Z. I think I'm dealing with it pretty nicely. You understand how important it is that Auroville shows the way? Yeah? I don't know. Okay. I have something to say. Yeah? Uh -huh. uh, you see, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Ram Narayan. I am here in Auroville for the last 21 years. I was born and brought up in Odisha. I was deeply involved in the uh, integral education movement, Sri Aurobindo integral education movement in Odisha. And I was also one of the executives of the uh, um, highest body over there in integral education. And uh, in Odisha, they uh, also sought the help of government in form of uh, a grant. And yeah. when the grant came from the government, they laid certain conditions. Oh, you have to have this kind of teachers, this kind of curriculum, this kind of this. And some people, those who are deeply into the philosophy of Mother and Shobindo, they said that, yeah, this is really not okay. That doesn't help us to become what we want to become. Then while many others, you see, we have about, uh, right now around more than 600 Sri Aurobindo schools. So uh, 30 years back, uh, one of the schools uh, uh, said, okay, we have made this, we have made this, we have made this to make ourselves self-sustainable. We don't want your grant. Throw the, they threw the paper in front of the executive body of the uh, meeting. Um, and that is, if she, if we can, uh, that, that gives me the strength because it is a practical experience to say what I said before, that once we make ourselves, uh, um, uh, the government not needed for us, uh, then we can surely be free what we had uh, come here and uh, working for the our um, term with the divine will continue as we wanted to become what mother said thank you i just uh, want to go back to the um, uh, personal sa different personal sadhana and collective sadhana uh, what i feel uh, is my perception, uh, my feeling, um, that uh, uh, when uh, one does uh, an effort, uh, uh, personal effort, and uh, um, work on uh, uh, the proper sadhana, is not that one goes out of the collectivity, because whatever we uh, realize, uh, even uh, um, can be shared in the collectivity because uh, we are connected. Um, what uh, I, I can, uh, oh, can happen, uh, can realize, can be uh, part, uh, comparted also with uh, others uh, people. And um, yeah, I don't see all uh, this uh, difference. Uh, if, uh, so many people does the, uh, the proper um, work, uh, interior work, can be shared, can be uh, every, the community can uh, um, have a um, good uh, result also. And uh, even uh, doing a, a, pro, uh, 
an effort on the sadhana, because in this moment is really more uh, uh, strong the need uh, one feels. One can even uh, uh, feel, uh, sometimes, I love for uh, um, what we see the other uh, people, uh, the, 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 the side and the other side, but uh, one goes uh, over. This doesn't mean that one can accept all the um, mesquinity. Uh, I don't know if it's the correct English word, but um, yeah. Uh, one meaningness of the um, uh, some uh, person, especially on the, um, I must say, uh, 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 the secretary or rather, uh, because uh, we are suffering a lot for uh, some uh, things. But uh, I have this hope that uh, 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 concentrating on uh, uh, even the personal sadhana will bring uh, something uh, um, more uh, high. So, just a sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting, ma'am, is that you need collective sadhana, which is different from personal sadhana. It's a very different level of activity and it requires, uh, you know, it requires us to say we don't know what it is. I think that's really why the mother, I mean, that's my personal opinion. Mother and Aurobindo have said, start a city. There are so many ashrams. There are so many other little places that are doing this which is personal sadhana. Why did they say city? Right? So I've been really asking this question, why is city? Yeah, I, I'm, I read Aurobindo. I got started in my journey because I read Sri Aurobindo. Okay, quickly. Right? So my sadhana, yeah, my sadhana can happen without the city, my sadhana cannot happen without a collective. My sadhana cannot happen without friends and a sangha. Yeah. But I'm not, yeah, if I, if I ask myself, how am I to be part of a city? I don't know. It's a huge, phenomenal effort. Yeah, what? Uh, great, uh, sorry. great effort. I heard so much, uh, so much speaking of yantra and all this. What is my perception is that uh, we in uh, interior, in, in, uh, inner, uh, uh, we, uh, everybody of us has a, a, a place in this uh, uh, community, collective uh, uh, um, life. And uh, we must uh, incarnate the yandra. It's not the cement or uh, the um, my, my feeling. Eh? It's not the uh, cement or uh, the house here, the road uh, like that, and so. But it's uh, a, a realization of uh, an inner, <clears throat> an inner realization that everybody of us is a place in this uh, general. Uh, uh, design, divine design. So just uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your um, very precise and uh, analysis of the dynam dynamics at play in Auroville. Thank you for this work. Um, I meet you very much uh, when you state that um, the starting point of finding solution might be a shared I don't know. I share that with you a lot. Um, and I've always uh, tried to speak to even people that we now label the other side and telling that um, I can disagree with uh, ideas and eventually fight against ideas, but not against people, right? So for me, it's, it's not complicated to see the brotherhood even uh, on people on the so-called other side. 
So now my question remains. Um, I came this evening uh, because uh, the, the evening was announced as an opening up to dialogue. Um, and sincerely, I'm there with open heart to listen, to share, and not to express my, only my understanding of what should be our reality. Be really open. But where are the people here from the so-called other side who came with the same quality of not knowing an open heart? Where are they this evening? And no, I know, I know you don't know, and it's not your work. No, no, and it's not your work, because very, very uh, sensitively you said, this is not my work. I'm just saying that this is what is required to heal and to start, eventually, a dialogue. I agree with this. But, you know, we've had a very smart uh, lecture about someone who came here on stage uh, recently who said, they know, we know what you need, you need a, a kick, and we are going to give you the kick to wake you up. So they seem to really know what we need. Sure. And there is no, un, no openness to not know and share the question of what can we do best. So yeah. the question remains, how is it on our side, if you are in this, let's say, open state of not knowing, openness, wanting to share, as you started to speak with the heart, I've seen you speaking with the heart, you know, last uh, 10 minutes, how is it if only we are open to that and something is imposed on us which is related to concepts and politics? There is no, I don't know in this. Sure. I agree with you. After Sudha, maybe? Or is it connected? See, oh, Natasha? Sorry, Natasha. I didn't see you. Sorry, Natasha. Natasha has been waiting for a long time. Yeah. I really want to thank you for this framework. It's really uh, insightful and wonderfully arranged. And I could really identify all those archetypes within myself. And that was an exciting little journey to go on while I was listening to you. And I think that that in itself is an amazing tool. I think the analysis part blocks. Suddenly when the analysis came, suddenly my, I could watch my own walls come up. And that didn't sure. help me. And yeah, maybe it helps other people, but I think as a community, anything that can come to us that broadens and widens and expands our awareness is really helpful and very welcome. And I think that that is what is the power of the RA, is to be able to just sit together. That's why when we listen to Kirit Bhai's talk on what is the RA actually meant to be, it's really not about the decision-making about who thinks of what and how we should come to anything. It's just about being able to sit together in a space and increase this sense of expansive awareness. And then, as you said and as he said, this thing of the unknown will happen and none of us know how. And it's just to give that a chance. And so that I think this whole, all these events of this last year are really preparing us for that. So the, the main thing that put my walls up in your analysis was that, you know, that basically we were being told that we were these little children who have done so badly. I'm so disappointed in Oroville came across quite often in your, in your talk. And From actually, me? I, I, that's how I heard it. So maybe that's the oh, way I received it. No, but uh, I, 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 for me, I, this year is preparing us for what I, the RA I'm is meant to that I get from what I'm hearing from each other. Okay. No, what you heard. No, you I heard, mean, Raghu, to be honest. I'm reflecting, I'm reflecting what I heard from But from in the one group. way or the other, you know, I have a very clear stance 
And yet yeah. I feel like I'm neutral because I do not demonize, okay. but I have a stance. Great. And Good in the same you. way, I think that you also are neutral, but you also have a stance which is very clear. So, you know, in one way or the other, okay. you, you come across I'd love to, as No, I'd love to have a chat. I'd love to have a chat with you and discover what is my stance and... No, it comes that's across. That's the way a dialogue least, will start, right? So that's why, that's where we kind of put people into boxes. I know I've been put into a box. I'm a box that right. is, stands on one side when I don't actually feel like that inside. And the similar right. with you, because of the way okay. in which the presentation is done, it feels like there is, there isn't a, there isn't a feeling of feeling safe with you. There's a feeling that okay. there is, you know, so that for me puts up a wall. And that's not helpful. So that's sure, why I, I think understand that. that I think that these kind of tools can be really helpful if we can just share the tool and not the analysis. And that each one of us can do for ourselves. And sure. that is the power of the RA. If all of us are doing it simultaneously and we and that from that emerges some collective something, that's our answer, but not Raghu's analysis of it. Mm. And yet I'm grateful. <laughs> Sudha and then Hans. Hmm? Hey, Raghu. Um, hi. Hi. So as I was sitting and listening, um, I'm, for qualifications, I'm a volunteer here in just six months. Um, but when I came here, yes, it was the call of the vision that brought me here. And I'm, as I'm sitting, I'm listening what comes to my mind is the image of the bridge. And you brought this word about creative tension. Uh, and I'm just trying to articulate this, that there seems to be an intent, there is an investment, but there is also a hurt. And there is the personal and there is the collective. And this bridging is the meaning making process or the collective listening or the sadhana but I also heard you say about our competencies and our capabilities and what's our capacity. How do I generate the self uh, generative capacity and the resilience to be able to hold both and bring that healing space? That's what I'm like listening and at the space that I am in right now, where you have brought the archetypes and you talked about where the first two is there and we are at the transition where we need to bring the infrastructure for the next level of growth. You talked about the clan and the network. So there also we're talking about how do we grow to realize the vision. And as Aurovillians, I also know they all want to realize and manifest the vision. We're working towards it. Yes. And sometimes we lose our path. And that is, I think, life journey. But I'm kind of said in an experiment over here, which is very clearly the city and the spirituality that we're bringing in. How on this bridge can we, I heard you say, I don't know as a space, but how can we, when very clearly we don't have somebody out there telling us what to do, and I'm not bringing the angle of the government out over here at all. Um, and yet there are the teachings to fall back and each one can have a different interpretation, interpretation and experience of that depending on the level of our own experience and maturity that we have. How do we still harness this collective uh, to bridge this, where we are talking about to bring that cohesiveness or coherence? So I don't know whether I'm making sense in my question, but that's where I'm left at now. We'll have to, if there are 25, 30 people with a strong question, we start from there. Yeah. Hi again. Uh, I feel that uh, the last ages, um, no decision making process was really clearly developed. And I think meeting together with coaching processes is great. It's really very, um, you learn a lot. But this is about decision making progress, uh, uh, process, progress in that. Uh, because I feel, again, it has been, it's never coming up enough and that is the urgency of the city and the building of the city and that is, was my main uh, thing here, that's why I'm a neutral. 
not believing the narrative of the Save Auroville people, by the way. Uh, I don't believe the democratic process is really... It's good for us to go through democratic process because I learn from, from everybody and we have great coaching materials and it's great. But it's all about uh, that urgency and uh, nobody speaks about that. That urgency of building that city, at least starting to have a skeleton, a major step in that. And because we never had any major decision-making process, because it's always been hijacked by the forces you talk about, not by individuals, these are just things that happen, it's a sociological phenomena, and nobody is to blame, but I think it's time we start setting that up, and not as a democracy, but as a small group that represents and is willing to do that time and that effort to go into intuitive intelligence and make decisions that will be the authority because you cannot have everybody questioning everything all the time and going crazy with it. And uh, the, the city, I, I feel, it's my intuition, there is a strong urgency to build that city. That's my deep feeling. And it's always being rubbed away, uh, community process and this and that. But I feel that building the city itself is a community process many things will come out of that. Because if people bother to look at that plan, why she made it like that, why she gave so many years of the end of her life to that material building of the city, it has many aspects that will help us uh, to solve many of these problems we talk about. That's uh, what I wanted to just, um, I can't help it saying it, that that's really my uh, deepest uh, feeling here. Thank you. Yeah, if I can just add something to what you're saying, Hans, the, you know, the, the dialogue between decision making, organizing, which is the head and the heart is the most difficult dialogue in the world. No, all organizations break down out here. Right. So that is a very critical thing for all of us learning the dialogue between these two. And my sense, I mean, that's what I'm saying here, that when you come to that edge, right, you're all falling back. There's something that has to be done to go forward. Right, and that's not an easy place. It's a very difficult place. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I'm called into an organization, no? it is after they've screwed up on the decision making and the hearts are all screwed up and then they come and say, fix it. Right? And then you, yeah, you have to, when you start really fixing it, right, invariably, the other processes take over. Right? The big difference, like I mentioned, I think, in the talk between an organization and Auroville is in an organization, there are clear boundaries, right? Of why you're there, there are lots of boundaries. You're a very open system. So, in an open system, the center has to be powerful and real for a century fugal force, otherwise it will all be centripetal. Yeah, I couldn't draw a 3D diagram like your galaxy, otherwise I'd have tried to do that with different people coming in and there's a barrier somewhere and then they get thrown back into the thing and that's, you know, at one conceptual level, that's what I think is happening. Yeah, and yet the center is so uh, you know, uh, attractive that you keep coming back to it. Okay. Any more sharings? Questions B, you wanna? Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Raghu. Just that last point that you made, where is that central core? The mother articulated that so well, because that's the matrimandir. 
And from the day one that Oroville started, that was the focus. And now uh, we're doing the gardens, we're doing other things, but the understanding of that soul, because she said that's the force that will hold it all together. So we connect to the soul, it's a symbol, but we, it's connecting to our own soul. So I think we have what we need. It's just a matter of doing it. Okay, are we done? Any more questions? Anything else to be shared? Feelings, sharings? Can we wrap it up then? Is there anything you want to bring in from the chat, Devin? Nothing from the chat? Okay. Shall we then wrap it up? Yes. Yeah? Okay, Devin, do you want to <laughs> then come and... No, no, I think it's, 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 it's important that you come and wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Okay, there are a few thanks, Raghu. I don't know if you heard that. But, huh. <laughs> the mic is in my hands, so. Uh. Ah, okay. I was wondering what was happening on this side, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Raghu, so much for all your time and work done. And uh, thank you all for this dialogue. Uh, I think it's Hopefully, it's just a beginning of uh, many more such dialogues. Uh, before we close, uh, do you want to suggest any specific next steps uh, that we hold from here? No, I've already uh, put out this thing which is very similar to what Hans is saying, uh, to get a group of people to see whether we can, where we can start, right? Let's see what the response is. And I've offered my time. So let's see what happens. <laughs>